Holy frickin' crap, everybody! It's me, Monster Mac. How's my volume? It's good? It's way too high. Oh, sorry about that. Holy frickin' crap, everybody! It's me, Monster Mac, sitting on the side of me, the ever so handsome, training number one, and we're in fact in the Mac Cave, and you are listening to the Mac Cast. Training number one. What's up, dude? How you doing today? It's a mighty fine day. Beautiful day out. The weather is wonderful for this Matt cast because... What does that matter? Are we outside? What, this? No, we're not, but it, it, it lifts spirits, you know what I mean? It makes people's moods good, and uh, I'm down for that. Trainer one is going to kick it off with the intro because he's so awesome at it. He's very fine, sexy. I, I should I just get into the intro, all right? You're getting very, very detailed there, Matt. Before we get into the intro, I got a bone to pick with you, pal. Me? Yeah, yeah you. Well. You would say, all right, podcast, 1230. I show up to your house. To, to get ready for the podcast, you're off lollyga- lollygagging around with chicks. I'm sitting in my car outside your house waiting. What's up with that, dude? You, you know, Monster Max's first mission is to take care of the ladies. You know that. And I had some lady business that I had to get out of the way. It's not my fault that you show up 15 minutes early, all right? Lady business, this guy. And Mac, um... Again, this is another podcast sponsored by New Republic Printing. You're not wearing your uh, official MacCast hoodie, but you were wearing it earlier. I was wearing it when I was outside. Even though it's a lovely day, you can still stay comfortable in the mighty fine fabrics that the they, they, New Republic uh, gives you. Uh, fans, wrestlers, bands, everybody, NewRepublicPrinting.com. They got great deals, high-quality products, fast turnaround. It's the ish that we use, so you should use it too. So with that said, Mac, New Public Printing on Facebook, on Twitter, all that good stuff. Look it up. In the Mac Cave this evening, we have a former wrestler, booker, and promoter, none other than Lethal Paul himself, Paul Azan. Uh, my name is Paul Azan, and I'm an alcoholic. See, no, wrong, wrong meeting. Wrong, wrong oh, meeting. Sorry, yeah, wrong place. That's, that's after the Mac Cave. Sorry. We have no French wine here. That's why we're keeping it. A, this is a clean and sober podcast. Okay. So how's it going, Paul? How you doing, man? Uh, I guess it's going okay. I want to thank the both of you. It's, it's a very cool thing that you're doing here. Uh, I like the fact that you're letting some of the old boys tell their stories because it's stories that need to be told, and we still have things to offer for the guys coming into the business, and I just appreciate the both of you. Thank you very much. Oh, no, no, man. I mean, it's our pleasure. We love having guys come down and, and like you said, tell their side of the story. And I, We grew up around this stuff, so it's pretty cool to, to sit down with the guys that we were watching as fans, and then listening to the backstage stories and all that that it came from. That's what the Matt cast is all about. We like to get the info out to the fans and to the newcomers in the wrestling business. Uh, let them know that uh, th- these guys have been around a long time, and uh, they have a lot of stories to tell. And uh, I would like to thank you for coming down all the way to the Matt Cave. I know it was a long travel uh, going through all the uh, the darkness and, and stuff. It's it's just quite the travel. Stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of bricks and, and stones and sticks and all kinds of stuff. But uh, you made it, and I'm very happy. We're going to kick it off with my first question. We got Mac News, don't we? We easily get into Mac News. Yeah, um, we are making our wrestling uh, return after some uh, very deserved time off. Yeah. And uh, uh, to the RWA, uh, by the time this Mac cast comes out, you probably it probably would have happened already. Yeah. So... Uh, let me just breeze right through it. We kicked some ass. It was great. Uh, I think that's what went down. I'm pretty sure. And uh, we also will be uh, defending uh, NWW Extreme Tag Team Championships. And uh, that's going to be coming up in the, in the near future. Training them on has all the dates. So get with him. Hit him up on Facebook <laughs> if you want to know. That's uh, Facebook.com slash Holy Crap It's Monster Mac. All right, Mac, back to uh, – is that all the news? We're defending yeah, the belts May 17th for NWW so you know. so at the uh, the Legion Hall in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And, uh, uh, yeah, we, I, I like the confidence for the RWA match, too. That's pretty <laughs> sweet. Yes, um, and so, yeah, that was your Mac news. Training number one, he's like a bank full of info, and uh, he just feeds it right to me. But uh, Paul is on. Um, my first question is – Can I just call you Paul? <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody calls Paul. me Paul Lazan. I hate that. <laughs> All right. Then we're going to stick with Paul. Can I call you Paulie? No. No, no, Paulie. All right. Paul. Yes. Um, Lethal's fine, too. Uh, lethal's good, too. Yeah. All right. So uh, as a child, right, 
Yeah, we go way back. Let's yeah, go we back. Like jump I'm in ready. that time machine and, and take it a, a few years. I back. made it to the Matt Cave. I can do that. Let's do it. <laughs> so um, what really piqued your interest in wrestling? Like, tell us your, your beginning story of uh, wrestling and, uh, and how it affected your, your childhood. Um, that's really simple. I can remember being, I'm not sure of the age, seven, eight years old, and putting on the TV and finding WWF on Saturday morning. I believe it was Channel 6 where I grew up in New Bedford. And uh, every time I would put it on, Dad would shut it off. Yeah, not a fan? Not a fan. Hated it. It would tell me, don't watch that F word crap. You know what I'm, I don't say that word. I hate it. But uh, don't watch that. I want you to watch football. I want you to watch this stuff. I want you to watch that stuff. So, Dad, you want to take it away? When you're not around, I'm going to watch it. (laughs) And probably about... 10 or 11 years old, no word of a lie, I was trying to figure out the spots. I knew what an international was without (laughs) calling it international. I knew what they were going to do next. I was predicting the finishes. I absolutely loved it. It was in my blood. It was in my system from the start. Now, do you think that the fact that you had to, like, hide it, that added to the appeal of it growing up? Absolutely. It was kind of like a secret thing. Yeah, it's like drugs. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just sneaking in some wrestling and when nobody's paying attention, getting a little... Absolutely. Getting a hit of that headlock. (laughs) Absolutely. I needed my fix every Saturday morning, and I got it, whether they knew it or not. So you said you uh, you became what now we're guessing is, is called a smart mark at a young age. <laughs> Absolutely. And you, you're figuring out finishes. You, you realize it's kind of a work. Mm-hmm. You, you're getting the idea behind it. Absolutely. W- when do you start um, getting involved with wrestling? Was it just you were a fan for so long? Or? Yeah, I was a fan probably until I was about 18. And uh, when I was 18, there happened to be a school in New Bedford. And I would drive by the school on my way to work every day. And they had one of those flashing arrow signs out front. Yeah. <laughs> Wrestling, Saturday night, and the date. And then at the bottom, become a pro wrestler and the phone number. And I drove by it every single day. And every single day I said, you know what? One day I'm going to call that number. And I don't know how long it was that I kept driving by, but one day I called the number. And the first person I talked to was Joe Eugenio. And uh, Joe Eugenio said, come down, meet me. And we'll talk. Came down, met him. As soon, the second that I walked into that arena and saw the chairs and the lights and the ring, I you, said, that's it. Was it. Sold. That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I don't care what they do to me. I'm here. This is my future right here. So uh, before, so that was your first time stepping in the building. You haven't seen any Yankee Pro Wrestling shows uh It was New beforehand. England Wrestling at oh, the New behind. England Wrestling. Yep. I said. It was New England Wrestling. Yeah, this was 1990. Oh, we're going way back in yeah. the time machine. I'm old. <laughs> so uh, you, your first impression was good. Um, was it that day that you started training or was no. it like a pre-meeting? It was a pre-meeting with Joe Eugenio. He told me, I asked him, I said, is it is it the F word? And he said, no, it's what you see on TV. They protected, business was protected then, yeah, which there. is really good. And I said, okay. I said, I would like to come and watch a training. And uh, he said, okay, I'm going to have to have you meet my office manager. Okay. We made an appointment. I show up to a a training one night, and I go into the office, and that was my first meeting with Cousin Seth McCoy. Okay. Okay. I don't think we got along from the second we we were eye to eye. Right away. Right away. I don't think he liked me. (laughs) I don't think he liked me, and it was probably because of all the questions I was asking. But isn't that what you're supposed to do? You know. Right, yeah, yeah. So I asked him, is it the F word? And he said, you know, no, it's what you see on TV. You know, uh, what we do here, I don't care what anybody does anywhere else, what we do here is not easy. We train hard. You know, you're going to earn your place here. And believe me, there's nothing... F-A-K-E about it. I said, okay. So I signed up. (laughs) Now, uh, you sign up. How long is it before your first training? Like, how were those first few days where you're just, your money's down, you paid, and then you haven't trained yet? Like, what's going through your head? I was freaking out. I was scared to death. Scared to death. Didn't know what I was doing, but knew I had to do it. Right. One of those deals, you know. So... But who uh, who was running the trainings at the time at the uh, NEW school? Brian Breger. Okay. And Brian Breger, if uh, anybody who doesn't know who Brian Breger is, there was an old Papa Shango spot where the lights went out, and when they went back on, the the uh, jobber in the ring, 
had where his boots were on fire and he had some black goo all over okay. his face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's Brian Brigo. That he was, he was running the uh, the New England wrestling school. Right. He was running. He was actually taking the new guys and getting you ready for Silvano Souza in the back. We had two rings, yeah. one out front for the new guys and one in the back for the veterans. And uh, he's the one who taught us all the busy stuff, the lockups, the the top wrist lock, you know, reversals, busy moves, all that kind of stuff. The last thing you learned with Brian Brigger was how to take a bump, and then you, when you were, when you had every all the basics, you were released to Sousa. Well, I say that's uh, that's different. I've never really heard that in the school. I believe uh, Brickhouse Baker, um, in his podcast, mentioned that he could have been one of the guys to get his boots on fire because uh, he left town at the time to uh, to do the job for the WWF. So he said that 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 could have been him, but uh, very interesting. I don't think when Brickhouse said that, he meant specifically the dude who got his... Yeah, I don't think he meant that spot. I just think that what Brickhouse was saying, he could have been a a job guy on TV if he didn't go to Wisconsin. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly, but that was two... That was his later. Yeah, yeah. That was 93. This man's crazed. (laughs) Brickhouse mentioned the fire boots and that you're pinpointed directly to it. Um, So after you train... Uh, in the you learn the basics. You guys got sent over to Silvano Souza, right? And he smartened you guys up, or well, let me let me say one thing before we move on. There were thirty guys in that class with Brian Briga, right? There were two guys left when it was over, and it's you and who Nick Steele. Okay, so guys, anybody else of any recognition? The other twenty eight dudes. Mm. No, <laughs> no, nobody. Just that was it for them. Never wrestled again. No, like, they were gone. They didn't. They didn't survive the class. Now, how long was it that were you guys working in that first ring for? Uh, I believe I was in that first ring for three months. So it's two a week. Uh, three times. Well, I went six times a week. Every so you night, were going every almost night every night. That, that was we had training three nights a week. But every night that that gym was open, I was there in the ring. Yeah. Whoever was there, I would work out with. And you were just showing up just to yep. Just to be in the ring. Right. So, but, uh, yeah, there were 30 guys. There were two left. It was Nick Steele and I. And uh, Nick Steele got called over to Sousa's first. And I went home, and I almost cried myself to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> because I figured, like, I'm oh, not going to make it. Yeah. It's, it's going to be Nick, and that's it. A week later, I was called. But you know how it is. So... So you go, it's you and Nick Steele. Yep. He's only got like a week on you in the, in the, in the new ring. Right. It, uh, and so Sly Sousa smarting you guys up kind of or like? Not really. Not fully. Right? Not fully. The way, what you were told before you went into Sousa was keep your ears and your mouth shut. Uh, keep your ears, yeah. <laughs> keep your eye. You, let me try this one more time. Keep your mouth shut and your eyes and your ears open. Yeah. Do not speak unless spoken to. You're going in there, and you're basically a training dummy for the other guys. Respect this business and learn where you come from. And that was what we had going into there. And we did, and the veterans didn't talk to us. Right. Nobody talked to us. You guys basically were the tackle dummies. You earned your spot, and it's not like that anymore. It really isn't. There isn't a place where you can go, and the other guys are role models for the new guys coming in. Right. These guys were, they were basically, they were teaching us, but at the same time, they were horrible to us. Right. (laughs) They were weeding out the crap. If you didn't, you know, if you couldn't take what they were doing, you left. And that's basically what happened to most guys. Yeah. You know, so you had to be a special person, you know. This This is 1990, you said, right? About 1990, 1991. So wrestling is on, you know, it's pretty pop, huge from the 80s. This is before the steroid deal, the second one? I believe, yes. I believe it was. Because there was a weird dip in business in, like, what, 95, They had no problem 95. putting 500, 600 people in that mill. And that's no what they problem. were doing yeah. on the regular. Yep. And that's no names. No names, no. Just, every, just local. Building their own stars, correct. And do you feel like that's missing a lot in indie wrestling now? Absolutely. 100%. Did I ever bring a name into LPW? No, there was a reason for it. Right, because you were trying to... Because those guys there didn't deserve someone to come in off the street and take away all their thunder. Right. That's what I, how I feel. And now, how long uh, did you train with uh, Silvano? Uh, 
well, how long did you them before long. your first match? Because I'm sure. Yeah, it wasn't after long. You started wrestling, but of course, you Nick Steele got his first match before I did. Was it just, was it just a week before? Or? No, it was. No. We ran every two weeks, so it was probably two weeks before me. Okay. He got the first deal, and then I got the second one, and. Uh, I remember the day they called him again. I went home. I felt horrible. I said, "I'm not going. I'm not going to be able to do anything in this business." You know, you just keep second guessing yourself, and you know, I'm killing myself for what? You know, we did chop shop all the time. I don't. You guys, you know what shock bait is? Shock bait. No. Shock bait is one guy's in the ring, and the rest of the guys come in for two minutes and give you all of their moves. Oh. <laughs> Shit. Sounds right. They hit all this shit for for two minutes, and then he says, "Time." Next that guy time. slides out. Next guy slides in, and you keep going. We did chop shop and shock bait so much. Yeah. We ran two miles before we started working out. Every training, every single training. Just the building. And Souza would whip chairs at our legs for us to jump over them. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It works. Yeah, it it absolutely that. works. What a strong foundation anybody came out of that trained with Souza. Yeah. It was unbelievable. The basics they had, and anybody with good basics will be a good worker. Yeah. Anybody. It was, it was something else. It was amazing, you know? So you, uh, you finally got the call for your right. first match. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what kind of thoughts are going through your head? Like, uh, <laughs> who's, who's your opponent? Scared to death. My opponent was uh, Dave Roulet, Shockwave. Sh Pre-robot shock, pre shockwave. Pre-robot shockwave, yeah. We had our own shockwave. And uh, he was a big guy. And they told me you're working with Dave. Now, at this time, I'm 150 pounds, so maybe. So, small dude, yeah. yeah. Yeah, really small. I had to borrow my boots. I had to borrow my tights. Um, somebody grabbed me by the back of the head and said, if you borrow those, make sure you return them to him. I forget what it was. It might have been Colossus. Yeah, who'd you borrow them from? Uh, Maverick Wild. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he said, you better return them and do the right thing. And I said, I will, I will. So I went out to work the match with Shockwave. Uh, I look at it now, and I think it was horrible. I think I did a horrible job. It was just, it was your basic 80s WWF squash match. Right, so you just went out there, a little bit of fire, just he, he gave me one. He gave me one hope. That was it. You know, I did the I did the the reversal with the handspring with the arm reversal. A couple of punches whipped him off. It was over. Just done for <laughs> you at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he said to me, "How do you feel about taking a spine buster from jumping off the ropes?" And of course, I have no clue. So I'm like, "Sure, yeah, whatever, whatever you need." Let's go out before the match and try it. So I get up on the second rope, jump off with the double axe handle. He hits me with the spine buster, no problem whatsoever. We go out there and do it in the front of the people. Well, he does it ten times harder. He cranks me. Yeah. My head hit the mat. His head hit mine. Knocked out cold. You or him? Me. Okay. Yeah. How's it? Cold. I still have the tape. I watch it every once in a great while, and I say to myself, "That's how I started my career." That's that's match one, right? Out there. cold. I woke up with the ref saying to me, "Oh shit! Oh shit! You all right? You all right? Oh my god! Oh my god!" <laughs> That's a terrifying way to wake up with just people around you going like, dude, are you, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I was out. Huh? I was out. So they rolled me out of the ring. I went in the back, and I heard some of the veterans talking and saying, he ain't coming back. He's done. Monday night, I was back in training, and the guys were like, oh, but, all right. Maybe. Maybe we got a contender here. So that was that. Even though you got knocked out cold, did you remember the turn, return your boots? Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, so I that did. to make sure. That was one of the first things I did when I came through the back. They were like, are you all right? I'm like, hold on. I got to <laughs> I gotta take care of this. Now, now, rough estimation, how many undiagnosed concussions would you say? Eight. At, eight at least? Eight or ten, yeah. Yeah. I'm actually in the process right now as we speak. I had an EEG this week, and I'm going for MRI Friday on my head because I have a lot of problems. So Now, you think that's a result? From, yeah. Yeah, just mm, yeah. now it's is it? Bumping your head on the mat, taking bumps? Is it too much crazy shit when you were younger? Yeah, I, I was hitting the head with everything. I mean, we did garbage can shovels. I mean, you name it, we took it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, basically head trauma. Now, you, a lot of that clearly not from the, the very beginning of your career, I'm assuming. It was, it was no, no, it was later on. It was later on. When the body started to go, you start to do more hardcore to make still continue to make money. 
more brawling, more hardcore. You know what I mean? Yeah. And at the time, I was winding down and getting out of the business. Hardcore was huge. So right, right. So um, you have your first match. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you get jobbed mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. And uh, you you say, guys, don't think you're going to show back up. You show back up to training. You're ready to go. You keep showing up to training. Right. You keep working shows in the regular forum? Or? Yes. Every two weeks I was in a show getting beat up by somebody. Now, now who was it? Who who had some of – you mentioned a little earlier that the uh, the veterans wouldn't talk to you exactly. Were right. you working with a lot of the veteran guys? Or? Yes. Mm-hmm. You would, it was like just like old WWF TV where they would have a glorified job is getting the ring. You know, I don't know if you you guys have probably seen that old stuff, especially with uh, WWE yeah, yeah. Network now. Um, you get in the ring, five minutes, you take all their moves, you put them over with the finish. That's that's basically what would happen. And that's know? what you were doing basically every two weeks. That's what I was doing every two weeks, yeah. Who were some of the names of the guys that, w- that were uh, in? Oh, Colossus, uh, Bruno the Boston Bodyguard. Um, who were some of the heels that I worked with? Rick Fuller. Uh, Fuller don't play. No, Fuller, Fuller didn't play with me in the beginning. We're good friends now. <laughs> now I, I love Ricky now. We're, we're great now. But, uh, yeah, in the beginning, you were scared shitless to get in the ring with Fuller. You know, one chop and you, you, you're afraid you're going to have hot palpitations. <laughs> that, that's legit. <laughs> have you guys been chopped by Fuller yet? Oh, I, one time at a training oh. like before a show at one of your deals. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, that's... <laughs> In a match, usually it's a lot hotter. Oh, I would assume. Yeah. I, the training chop, I was just like, whoa, okay. Yeah, he's something else. I love Ricky. He's a big dude. <clears throat> so you just started off in wrestling. What were you looking at for a, a ring name or, or gear I wasn't, or like that? I wasn't. Nothing we weren't, we weren't just... allowed. You weren't allowed. The way it is now, guys come into indie promotions with their gimmick, with their name, with this and that. You weren't allowed. I was called Paul Lazard, L A Z A R D, <laughs> because Souza didn't know my last name. Ah. So he just made one up. And that was it. That was your name. And if you said anything about it, I probably would have been out. So you shut up and you do your job. So, uh, as Paul Lazard, how long did you work uh, for New England Wrestling? Uh, I worked, well, as Paul Lazard, it was about a year yep. that I did jobs and got beat up by, anybody, by everybody. Where was the turn? Well, when they moved to Cogsall Street, they were, this was Belleville Avenue in New Bedford. Yep. And then they moved to Cogsall Street. In New, it was like almost directly right around the corner, another mill. And um, then I went to, I don't believe Silvano Souza was there at the time. I forget who was He was booking. already gone. Or? Yeah, he was already booking. The, the boys were calling me Lizard. Lizard Man, Lizard Man all the time. They were saying, yeah, you should do a Lizard Man gimmick. So before I knew it, I was painting my face green with green gear, and I was lizard. <laughs> yeah. So, now that, lizard man, did that uh, did that help out with your win loss uh, record at all? Absolutely, I was going over on veterans as lizard man. As lizard man, yes, I was. Now, do you think a lot of that was kind of like uh, your payback almost for doing the jobs for so long? No, or? I think I, I'm pretty sure Joe Eugenio was booking, and I think he was smart enough to know if I don't create baby faces. The, the ticket sales are going to drop. Right. You know no, what I mean? Yeah. So he created Lizard Man, and I seemed to be over. And the more they put me over, the more... You got over. I got over, and, you know, things started to snowball from there. I went over... My first veteran to go over on was Blade Runner in uh, PAL Hall. Yep. And uh, I thought, sure, he was going to beat the shit out of me. I was like, this, this guy is not going to go for this. And he was so <laughs> professional... It was unreal. When it was time to go home, he goes, "This, this is, this is." He said something like, "This is it, kid," and uh, then he thanked me. Yeah, and I was like, "Whoa!" Yeah, he's thanking you. I'm, I'm starting to learn, you know, that this, this is pretty cool. I got my ass kicked for all these years, for all this time. It was worth it. Right now, I'm starting to be. I'm not a veteran, but I'm in that in between. You're at least getting some respect. Yeah, from well, the they're boys. starting to respect me. You know. Well, when you punch somebody in the face ten times, you you end up respecting them. Right, right. Like he <laughs> inevitable. Didn't complain. It's inevitable. Yeah, he didn't say nothing. You know, as many times as cousin Seth McCoy freaking stiffed me, and I never said a word and kept doing my job. Yeah. He can hate me all he wants. You know. Ugh. So from the lizard man, you're getting over. Right. You were. You said you're beating veterans. Mm-hmm. Is there any title contention for lizard man? Or? Well, what happened was. Bob Evans, brutal Bob Evans, we discovered him from a public access show. 
And we went there, and we asked some of those guys if they wanted to train. It was the origins of Power League Wrestling. And uh, most of the guys didn't want to. A lot. I, I find that a lot of backyarders want to be backyarders, and they're, they're a little afraid to take that next step. You just kind of get stuck there. Right. So a lot of guys didn't come. Bob came, and one other guy came, and the other guy ended up quitting after a couple of weeks. But Bob stayed. So... I remember showing Bob punches, kicks, things like that. So believe it or not, I'd like to go on record and say I was one of Brutal Bob's first trainers, which. <laughs> so you you seen, and it was a backyard wrestling show that you, you found on? Yeah, now, absolutely. Did, was it like a ring in a backyard or dudes on the grass? Yeah, it was, no, it was, the, he actually fabricated a ring out of and put gym like mats kinda on kind of like, yeah, like a fake me out ring. Yeah. Was, okay. Yeah, but uh, you know what? It was more than some people were doing. You know? Of course, yeah, man. So I, I give him a lot of credit. I give him a lot of credit for for actually doing that. And he would book matches, and he would actually have storylines, and you name it. You name so it. So Bob was the actual one running it. Yeah, it was Bob's promotion. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. It was his first taste of pro wrestling. Yeah. So he came to New England Wrestling, and we started training him. And what happened was Brickhouse did go to, was it Wisconsin, you I said? Think, I think it was Wisconsin is what right. he said, yeah. And Brickhouse and this guy, Bulldozer, a Kowalski guy, huge guy, six foot four, f- almost 400 pounds, really big guy. They were tag team champions, and somebody booked it so that Bob and I were going to go up against them in their big spring fling show, I think it was. Okay. <laughs> and what happened was the match was already made, and... Baker come to the, the the everybody and said, I'm moving to Wisconsin. Sorry to see you go, Brick, but I'm getting a strap. Because <laughs> yeah. you're going to drop the strap on the way out. You know, and he did. And he, they dropped him to Bob and I. And uh, now, Were you still Lizard Man at the time? Yes, I was. So it was. And Bob was Bob Evans? No, he was Peacekeeper. So it was the Peacekeeper and the Lizard Man. <laughs> What a great tag team, huh? Did you guys have a team name, or it was just kind of no, no. Two, you, two singles names together, kind of guy? Yeah, it was the little, it was the little green guy and uh, the tall redhead. <laughs> <laughs> so, I need to find a picture of that. I'm just saying. Uh, I have. I'd like to see some video footage of that one. Oh no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> so the peacekeeper and lizard man, you guys are tag team champions, right? And we start, we start, we get married to the dragons, the black dragon and the red dragon, Pete Laporte and Kenny Watson. And you just work with them. And we worked with them everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. everywhere. And New England Wrestling had so many road shows in those days. We were gone every weekend. Yeah, Joe was running a lot of schools, oh, right? What uh, what a time. Were you, was, were you guys switching belts? Were you dropping it to them? And no, it no. And I thought that's what was going to happen. I was like, okay, this is it. We're going to drop them to the dragons. Never happened. Never happened. We were going over on them everywhere. I, I was introduced to so many names on those tours, it was unbelievable, you know? Now, all these away shows you were doing, were you just working for New England Wrestling? Is mm-hmm. that pretty much it? Yeah, that's all I was doing. You weren't reaching time. out no other places no. at that time? Not yet? No. I was afraid to. I, I figured I needed a lot. I need to learn a lot more before I dared go into someone else's locker room. I was going to say, was that, I was going to ask if it was a, a choice from you, which clearly you said it was, or if it was, because we get a lot of uh, guys talking about how. Joe didn't like his guys working anywhere else. No, not at all. No, he was very... Maybe that's why the mentality was to tell me, you know, you're not ready to go anywhere else. Right. Because I thought I wasn't. But you're right. No, he didn't like that at all. If if some of the higher-up guys went to work with somebody else, you know, if they basically, like a Rick Fuller, if he told Joe, I'm going to work there, whether you like it or not, Joe would show up at the show. Because he wanted to see how his guy was being used. Stuff like that. Joe did that a lot. He would pop up at random other indie shows. Right. Like uh, he showed up. Uh, AJ Hot at one point was working for a place called PTW. And uh, Mac, you were on the show. And Joe showed up because AJ was there because he wanted to see everybody in the locker room freaking out. <laughs> and um, like freaking out that Joe Eugenio was there. It was like this big deal and all that. I remember listening to guys like uh, being all nervous or whatever. Now, you were a promoter after that, did long after long after, that. obviously. Well, um, well, actually, no, because then there was Coastal Pro Wrestling. Now that I think about the, yeah, it, yeah, and you kind of, and you ran Coastal Pro. So, well, Bob and I lost the straps, and yeah, then, yeah. If you want to, if you want to jump around, we can jump around. Oh yeah, I, w- I was just gonna say, did you ever like um, hold that same kind of 
rules with your guys like that. You can't really work anywhere else. No. Or is it just because it's a totally different time? Yep. You can work wherever you want if you work for me. You can work wherever you want. But, uh, you know, if I book you in a storyline, you know, I need to know that you're going to show up. Yeah, actually be there. That's all. So, yeah. So back to to you and Bob. Uh, Bob and I ended up losing the straps at uh, the Whalen City Festival against Colossus and Blade Runner. And... uh, Made uh, I was upset about that because they uh, they didn't want the strap on Bob. Nobody wanted the strap on Bob because he was too green. And they would always tell me, you deserve it, he doesn't, so we need to take it off you guys. And I was like, fine, okay, I'm fine with that. But when you beat the shit out of two guys in front of a couple hundred people the whole match and then hit them with a board at the end and cheat to beat them, yeah, that, yeah. there's no psychology in that. Right. There's none. Like, why did you have... You've been beating these guys down the whole time. Right. You should have just pinned me. I, w- I wasn't going to complain. I would have done the job. No problem. But then I get hit with a two by four at the end and then they pin me. Come on. I mean, that's, and at that point in my career where I shouldn't have known the psychology, I did. Right. You knew even right. at that point. That that right. Shit even at right. that yeah. point that that wasn't right. I have no problem doing a job for anybody. You don't have to. And damn it, did that hurt. <laughs> It was a stiff shot with that two that's by why, four. That's why you remember it too. Is, right, is, is, exactly. Knock the shit out of here. <laughs> right. So you guys lose the tag belts. Where does Lizard Man see himself? What happens Where? after that? The, they made me singles. And just as Lizard Man, or is still? Yeah, I was still Lizard Man. I was. It was starting to evolve as more as forgetting that I'm from the Everglades and that uh, I wore this green cape and stuff. Yeah. It was starting to evolve more like any character does. As time goes on, the guy becomes more of a guy than he does than what his character gimmick was. Yeah, right. yeah. It started to evolve, and then I started... More of a man, to, less of a lizard. Right. At that time, they brought in Gino Caruso to start training us to, getting, to get us better and better and better, and he was a phenomenal trainer. The original spoiler's son. Yep. Phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. I learned so much from that man. I went from being a basics wrestler to a high flyer, to a brawler, to everything. Psychology, what goes where, when you do it and why, things like that. You know, he he taught us, you know, the things they don't do anymore, like the work shake and what true kayfabe means yeah. and how you present yourself in a locker room, stuff that we were lacking. So it's know, just, we, he wasn't just teaching you guys things in the ring. He right. was teaching you how to act outside of the ring as a wrestler. Absolutely. We got a full education from Gino Caruso. Now, you have obviously a lot of the old school mentality in the way that you were trained. Right. Did you try to uh, instill that in your training, too, when you started running a school? I did, but I didn't do a lot of the training because I'm, I'm so beat up. Right. No, I, I don't mean you specifically, but I mean, you, you, yes. put, you when, put guys that you knew. When I was in gorilla position for the guy would go out, especially the guys that were green and new. Yeah. I would always stop and give them some advice before they went out and did it. You know, I tried to pass on some of the knowledge to them. You know, if if uh, you believe they'll believe is one of my biggest ones. Yeah. You go out. I would tell them they'd come back. I'd say you're out there, kid, and you're not believing in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, they're going to laugh at you. You go out there and you believe no matter what. If they don't believe today, they'll believe next time. If you're not selling it, they're not buying it. That's right. That's a good one, too. <laughs> and um, So you become a singles guy. You're working every two weeks still. Now, where are they running? It's just... Uh, it's Cogsall Street Cogsall and then Street. on the and road. Then, we would They would rent a van and put nine or ten people in a van. And, so it wasn't even just you, you guys were driving up there. They were doing it together. They were like, slap everybody in here. We're, we're going to a show kind of thing so that's it was awesome i was gonna say that sounds like a lot of fun it was, it was awesome we were we were completely drunk off our asses <laughs> all the way there all the way back we would pick up names at the airport we pick up guys like coco beware and jim the anvil night yeah, yeah. and they were partying just, with us yeah they're just as soon, get in the party van <laughs> you want to do this you want funny stories uh, i'm down with we're always down for a funny story on okay. the podcast we got coco beware in the van we're drunk we are massively drunk we stop at a rest stop, okay? It's in the middle of the winter. There's 15 feet high snow mounds from them plowing the rest stop. Coco Beware climbs all the way to the top of this snow mound, <laughs> drops his Zubaz, and starts pissing. Now, <laughs> he's doing this hula dance while he's pissing. And I believe it was Derek Blade Runner who yelled, Coco, there's a steady coming. He turned around and said, what? And tumbled down the whole <laughs> snow mound, pissed all over himself, and laid there laughing. And we're, we're, we're dying. Everybody was on the ground dying. 
quick, short, funny story yeah, I remember yeah. on the road. That's the stuff that, that sticks with you forever, though. It's the little things, like the yeah. f- the funny stories that are there no matter what now. I had a fist fight with Colossus in the van. Just, just started brawling. <laughs> Any, any real reason? No. He or? said something to me I didn't like, and I blasted him in the back of the head. <laughs> and he turned around, and we, we have a seat between us. And we're whack, 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 going at it back and forth. Guys are trying to pull us apart. Oh, boy, still just driving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Going to get to the show. Let them hit each other. <laughs> yeah. So you're a singles guy. When do you start working outside of New England wrestling? When Nick's father, which was Frank, started having problems with Joe. And he was like, screw this. I can do my own promotion. Yeah. So he started calling. He called me, called Nick, Bob, Brian Briga. And he said, all of us, let's go start our own promotion. And I'm like, "Eh, I'm kind of on the fence about, I don't know enough, this and that, blah, blah, blah. And he gave me a good pep talk. He's like, "You, you know, you know enough. I'll run the business. You guys run the wrestling. And we'll know enough, you know. So I made it. I made a mistake. Now I say it. I didn't say it then. But I made a mistake, and we started Coastal Pro Wrestling, and uh, we did good. You know, we only we we had a school, we ran shows at VFWs, we did okay. We didn't know anything, you know. Yeah, we didn't know anything. Now, was there a reason behind you leaving, or was it no? No, no there was no bad blood, nothing like that. I had no problem with anybody. the The locker room was divided for some reason. S- something went down, and. I was oblivious to it. I didn't get involved in the politics. I was afraid to get close to anybody there. I came in, I trained, I did my business, I went home. And that's how I wanted it. There was something going down. I didn't know what it was. So that was kind of maybe the, the, the feel, the locker room vibe, whatever. Maybe that was one of the reasons why I left. But I really didn't know what was going on. I don't have a story to tell you. I really don't know what was going on. But something was. There was some major heat. Something went down. Now, uh, how did Joe Gino uh, take your departure? He wasn't happy. <laughs> no, I can imagine he wouldn't be. Uh, like, so you, were you guys on bad terms after that? We went at it on the phone. We went at it on the phone, and then we were on bad terms. You know? I see. So th- that was about it. And then uh, we went and did Coastal. I mean, that lasted, I don't know. Six months, eight months. How many shows did you guys run in the six uh, to eight months? Not many. Five. It's almost one a, you know, one a month, one every two months. So yeah. How would you guys... Now, what was the drawing like? What, what year would you say this is? 93, I believe. So right at the beginning of the wrestling decline. Right. You guys started a promotion. Right. What were you drawing? We drew... Um... We were doing, we did a VFW in a Kushnet. I think it was a Kushnet. We drew 100. We did uh, the Seekonk American Legion, and we were doing 100 plus there. We, that was a pretty good, that was a good venue for us, the Seekonk American Legion. Then we did uh, Roseland Ballroom in Taunton, and they put like 500 people in there. But that was the addition of two guys that lived in Taunton. Like on the show? Yeah. We used two workers that lived in Taunton, and there was like 500 so, people. Yeah, like kind of ticket seller kind of guys? Yeah. It was um, Joel Davis and uh, okay, yeah. Mo Ping. <clears throat> so Coastal, you guys run Coastal. What? Where is? When do you make the decision, like, maybe this isn't going to work out? Uh, things started to fall apart. We didn't know what we were doing. Yeah, you guys just basically showed apart. a show. You guys yeah, right, right. scrambling to get things done. Yeah, down. It was, there was no money. I mean, Bob... Bob flew to Coop. He decided he was going first, so he took off first. And then uh, things were getting, you know, it was it was so bad. It was like a money pit, you know. We just didn't right. put money just into it. Money in. And it just it didn't work out. It just kind of fell apart, you know. It was really nobody's fault, just lack of knowledge. Right. We just, had no idea what we were doing. No business experience, just a bunch of guys just trying to put this together. Right. We, we thought it was that easy, and it's not. Now, what kind of shows were you guys running, like, you see, have like a lot of hardcore matches. Or none of that it was just straight. No, it was just straight wrestling. No, no, no names, anything like that. Nope. Just so it's just you guys. Just ran angles with the guys that we had, yeah. And we had guys from New England wrestling come over and work for us, and then go run back and tell Joe what we were doing. They'll be yeah, out of yeah, business. Yeah. They'll be out of business in a few months, Joe. Don't worry. And they were right. So did you, did Joe ever uh, pop up at any of your shows to watch to see what was going down? Um. 
I think he was outside one time, and Frank made him pay for a ticket so he didn't come in. Ah, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I think that happened one time, and then he never showed up. Trying to get Joe to part with money. Not exactly an easy thing to do. (laughs) Yeah, but, you know, it's funny you should say that. A lot of guys complained about the paydays, but I got, not then, but when I went back years later, Joe paid me in Fall River, New Bedford, which he never did on. Right, right. I would go and find him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, um, uh, Coastal's all done. Right. I go back to New England wrestling. You just go right back to New England wrestling. Went right back. And they have no problems. I went to apologize to Joe. He told me, don't apologize. I just need you to be loyal to me. You need to stay right here. And I said, okay. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, first opportunity that I have, (laughs) that I am out of here. I'm just coming back for the experience, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I went back, and Sousa put me under the hood and made me the black demon. So the lizard man was done? Done. Dead. Right, so now I'm back to being a job guy as the Black Demon. So do you feel like you started all over again? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was going to ask you, do you feel like they treated you differently after Absolutely. your departure? Yep, I did. I see. So you're doing straight job matches from there? But I'm Not sure straight. You... It, they were 10-minute, 15-minute matches, but I was jobbing. Yeah, you know? but with more experience this time. So right. I'm sure you got over a little more. Right. I was kind of, when they would put me with newer guys, I was kind of getting the new baby faces over, you know? Now, are you still going to uh, practice every week? Or? Absolutely, yep. Still same trainers, still just working with? No, Souza was gone, Gino was gone, it was whoever was there that night. It just, whatever guy showed up to help out. Yeah. Now, again, what are some of the names that were, were coming through to help out with you guys? I don't remember. I remember <laughs> working out. I remember working out with Nick a lot. Yeah, you just, know, and whoever showed up. Yeah, I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Be honest with you, nobody. You know, local guys. Yeah, just the, everybody. The local guys. Whoever was in New Bedford, Fall River. You know, we worked out at a place in New Bedford. Then they moved it to the PAL in Fall River. It was all over the place. You now, just. Now, uh, you you said uh, when Joe said you needed to be loyal that you were just thinking like when whenever the, my first chance to get out of here when when was that first chance? Uh, I believe it was ninety five with Big City Mike. I started doing indie shows at that point. We started working. Nick and I would go to places. Oh, geez, I forgot all about the WWF stuff, but. Let's hear about it. You're skipping right over it, man. I, I forgot all about it. We hooked up with Jack Savage. I don't know if you guys knew who Jack Savage was. Yeah, yep. Okay. Jack Savage has passed now, but he was in. And matter of fact, coming here, not to give anything away of where the Mac Cave <laughs> is, but I used to go and pick Jack Savage up, same route, to come to the Mac Cave, and it brought back a lot of memories. So On I, the way here, it kind of. There's another way that I appreciate you guys having me here because. Thinking about Jack Savage again was really good. Spocked up some old memories. Absolutely. Jack was a good guy. Jack, uh, we hooked on with Jack. We used Jack and Coastal Pro as our only ref. We had one ref for every show. And he was a good guy. He worked for Vince for 16 years. And uh, we figured he was a good guy to hook up with because he right. knew everybody. Yeah. He knew everybody. So sometimes it would be just me and sometimes it was Nick and I would go to with Jack and every time that WWF was in the area, anywhere from like Maine to how far did we go? New Jersey, you know, stuff like that. Anytime they were in the area, right. we would show up and Jack was like, I'll show you guys how to do this. We'd go, we'd follow the ring truck, we'd go in the ring door. And before <laughs> you know it, we're sitting in the locker room with the boys. Right. That simple. Yeah. You know? And Jack would walk around and say hello to everybody and you know, I'm sitting there and Scott Stein is looking at me like, who the hell are you? And you need to get out of here right now. You know, stuff like that. I saw ribs. I saw people putting a lock on gear bags and <laughs> hanging their gear bags on the showers. Uh, I saw the the Ray Roy Undertaker. You guys know who Ray Roy is? Uh, the name sounds familiar. Ray Roy not... was a job of events. Every okay. show, he was on TV a lot back in the okay, day. Okay, yeah, okay. And they, they they would they would they would mess with him all the time. Ray, go in my bag and get this. And he's in the bag, and they're like, "Take her, he's in your bag." <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that, you know what I mean? And the guy just they hated him. They hated him. Just and I would sit there, 
with my stuff, Nick would have his stuff, and nobody ever paid attention to me because if you look at me and you look at the other guy with the long blonde hair and the muscles and he's six foot tall, who yeah. are you going to use? Yeah, yeah. Tall you know? jack guy. <laughs> yeah, who are you going to yeah, use? Yeah. You're not going to use me, so I didn't get used. But um, that's really that. I mean, Jack introduced us to so many people. We went back and forth with the Hebners. We were in stitches. He would call Dave Earl and Earl Dave just on purpose just, yeah, all the just time. Yeah, just it was, to mess with them. It was hilarious. It was so hilarious, you know. We almost got thrown out of the locker room. I don't know how many times the boys would look at us like, you know, <laughs> who are who these the hell dudes? Are these yeah, dudes? you know. But then you guys, there were a few cool ones that would come and talk to you. We talked to Crush, and we talked to. So did you get to pick anybody's brain there? Or? Yeah, but sparingly, sparingly. Right. There was a time where Nick was mocking uh, Bret Hart right behind him, and I hope he listens to this and remembers <laughs> how scared shitless I was. Brett, I'm looking at the crowd. Brett's behind me, and Brett walks up to me, and he's like, oh, they're filling in. It looks like we're going to sell out. And I said, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I didn't know it was Brett. Right, yeah. And I'm like, like, yeah, cool, man. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it looks like it's going to sell out. He's like, who are you working with? I said, I don't know yet. So he's like, all right, see you later. And he walks by me like this, and I'm like, oh, shit, that was Brett. You think I should have turned around and been a little bit more respectful? Yeah, I probably should have said hi or something. <laughs> yeah, and then he's walking away, and Nick's walking behind him doing the Brett Hawk thing. Like, and I'm like, what the hell are you doing? We're not supposed to be here as it is. You know, shit like that. Nick was fearless. It just didn't give a damn. <laughs> yeah, right. And I'm scared shitless, of, you know, at that time, like, oh. But... So uh, <laughs> you uh, said you started working with Big City Mike. Right. We started doing shots for Big City Mike, and Big City Mike was a damn good payday. Holy crap. You drive two hours, it gave you 100 bucks. I was like, this is phenomenal. This, this you is know? a good night. Yeah, this is a good night. So we started doing shots for Big City Mike. Uh, he would call me, and he'd say, I can't use you to work. Can you ring an ounce? I'm like, yeah, what's the payday? 100 bucks. I'll be there, Connecticut. <laughs> okay. You know, stuff like that. So I ended up being... A ring announcer, a referee, a manager. I ended up doing it all with him. Whatever he needed, I always said yes. Even if he needed ring crew, I always said yes. Just always down. Because the paydays were great. And then he started Salisbury Beach. So I was in because I never said no. Right. I was in. So I went up there. I started doing jobs for him. And it didn't take long at all. It was a matter of months before I was on top. Now, the Salisbury, Salisbury Beach Wrestling, um, Maldoon talked kind of in-depth. We did a, we had Maldoon on. Right. And he, he spoke in-depth of it. Um, a lot of big crowds, apparently rowdy. Yes. And you guys had uh, time of your life. You have no idea. I could because sit here. the shows here. were right on the boardwalk, oh right? Oh, my God. I could sit here for hours and tell you Salisbury Beach stories. That was the best time of my wrestling career. That's what I did for a living. Right. We wrestled at Salisbury Beach. And that's, that's it. That's it. That's all I had to do. We wrestled Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Every week? Every week. And they gave me a room in the beach house. Damn, man. That's <laughs> it. So I would get up, out of bed, open the sliding glass door, and the beach was right Just there. right there. How could you ask for anything more? You know? There were other things taken care of, too. But we probably right, shouldn't right. go yeah, into yeah. that. <laughs> but everything we could possibly want was taken care of. After the show, we'd go to a bar. We'd all drink. Rick would pick up the bar tab. Yeah. So that does not happen much anymore. No, it does <laughs> not. But it was awesome. So we were all drunk after every show, 2 o'clock in the morning, singing, I got friends in low places, yeah. and then we all pass out. I mean, that was our weekends, every weekend. And uh, you said you were making a living off of doing this. Yes, and this I is was. a time when you could make a living being a, 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 working the independents. Right. right. And it's not too many people, not too many guys doing that anymore, especially no. now. Like, I mean, even like, uh, I don't know specifically like to, to the dollar amount, but guys who are working for like ROH under contracts, some of those dudes still have to have normal jobs mm -hmm. to like live life. Right. That's just a, to, the comparison between the two, like Maldoon running Salisbury Beach and you guys living off of, of pro wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> living the dream compared to guys who are now you know, getting 
ROH number three, the third biggest wrestling promotion in the country, right. not being able to pay their guys enough to live a, a sustainable well, wage. Well, you've got a lot of other things going on there, too. You've right, got obviously. Plane fares, right, you've right. got I mean, it wasn't that. We drove there, and that was it. Right, you know what right. I mean? So, yeah, we did nothing from Monday to Thursday. A lot of the guys, some of the guys left. Right, of stayed. course, of course. You just stayed up there the whole the whole. Sure, time. I was loving it. Why I not, was right? I loving it. Yeah, you had a ring to work out in every day. I had my home taken care of. You know, the money that I made took care of my food and my gas. What more could you ask for? And who were some of the guys that were uh, working up there? Because, I mean, earlier we we uh, were talking about Perry Saturn and, and uh, John Cronus, the Eliminators. Right, the Eliminators were there. Tony Atlas was there. Um, Eric Watts was there. Uh, who else was there? Nikolai Volkov was there. Trying to remember some of the other names that came. Mick Foley was there. Uh, that's. I think that's about it. There may have been a few others, but now, how does it? How do you feel going from working you say, as a jobber uh, in a mask, having to start all over again in New England wrestling, to going up to Salisbury Beach, and within a few months, you're on top with a place using guys like. Like you said, Mick Foley and with guys like Tony Atlas and the Eliminators. It was great. I learned a lot. We were on TV. We had people. If yeah, we went out and walked the, the strip, there was a boardwalk and there was all kinds of carnival games and places to eat and things like that. If any of us went out and walked, we were mobbed. Can yeah. you know, sign an autograph? Can you sign an autograph? Mob. Take a picture with me. Oh, it, was, it was great. It was unbelievable. Now, what was the, the TV situation there? Was it? All of mass or like no, it was satellite. It was a, it was satellite, a satellite channel. Deal? Yeah, because okay. we had a. I actually watched the first uh, Monday Nitro from in the ring in uh, Champs Arena in yeah. Silver Beach. We had a satellite feed and a widescreen TV, and all the boys were in the ring watching the first Nitro. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Just yeah. right there. Yep. So you're working uh, Salisbury Beach. How, um, who were some of the guys that you're working with? You said you were on top. Were you working yeah. with the names? Yeah, I worked with the names. So just right away. Yeah, right away. Within months. John was the booker. Now, obviously, Muldoon had some faith in you. Oh, my God. Muldoon is awesome. I'm a, we're big Muldoon fans, guy. too. <laughs> he notices guys who work hard. He, and, and if he has guys in his locker room and you work hard, and I had the same mentality that I was brought up with, keep your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open. I came in. I did everything they said. Before you know it, I'm the tag team champ, you know? He's got a strap on me. Yeah. Then it's over, it's up and up and up, and then at some point he took off. <laughs> yeah, Maldon. <laughs> Just one show, he wasn't Just there anymore. Where Maldon go? And I had no explanation why. Where, where's John? I don't know. I don't think he's coming. Okay. I think uh, Maldon always liked us because as soon as he was uh, doing, he started working with a Showcase Pro Wrestling when we were there, and um, we every show I would just put my seat right on the side of his and just pick his brain the whole night in the locker room. And I think that eventually just led to him being our friends. Now, like, John is just a close friend of mine, and I think it's mainly because I just wanted to get as much info out of him as possible. It's there. It's definitely there. This is a man that's worked with the greatest names in this business. He knows what he's talking about. He's been there, and he's humble as hell. You will never get such a cool dude. an ego statement from that man. Never. Even he deserves to put himself over. He won't do it. He's awesome. I'm friends with him, too. I love John to death. Love him. And it's you, you say that the whole no ego thing, and he, he should. I've seen him, like, tell guys, all right. Because, um, you know, again, he was helping people with finishes at Showcase and all that. And he's telling guys, like, oh, you should do this instead of that. or And just people just... I don't want to say ignoring them sometimes, but it's just yeah. like, how do you not listen? You know, because like, the the people that and this is this is anybody new that I don't know of because I could be wrong about. But my opinion on a whole is that the new guys coming in do not have the right upbringing. They're not taught etiquette anymore. When you walk into a lock, when I walk into a locker room now, nobody knows who I am and they don't care. Right. And Instead that of introducing yourself, how are you, brother? You know what I mean? Right. That's what we did. That's how we brought If somebody came in 
You never know if you've got a guy that was over in Texas and on TV 30 years ago. You know what I mean? Right. This and guy who deserves your respect. straight made a living doing it, and right. you're sitting here in, at a VFW hall with 55 people. Exactly. You should probably say hi to that dude and shake his hand. Exactly. You should say hi to anyone who enters in a locker room because they shouldn't be there if they're not, they don't deserve if, to be right. there. So that's what's lacking today. Now, do you think it's just that the, 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 there's not any teachers teaching that old school way? Or yeah. if there's too many schools, so guys are just everywhere, and it's, I believe there's too many schools, and there's not enough veterans teaching the young guys what they should be doing. You have guys who break in in their backyard, they do twenty flips off the top rope. A mock promoter will put them over and put a strap on them, and then before you know it, they've gained the respect of all of indie New England independents. Right, and they don't deserve it. They don't. You have to pay your dues, and you have to earn everything you get in this business because there are guys who are dead. There are guys who are paralyzed. There are guys who cannot walk up flights of stairs anymore because they paved the way for these guys, and you need to respect us. You need to know where, why you can do what you do in the ring because we paved the way for you. I just believe people should... I did it when I first broke in. I paid, you know, my dues, and I honored the guys before me. It should be done all the time, and you don't. You've got these four-foot-nothing guys with gear from Kmart on in the ring, and they're not respectful to the guys who came before them. And the business, those guys ruin the business. And the more years go on that we allow this to happen, the worse it's going to get. Before... There'll be nowhere, there won't be a place left for guys like you to work because everything will be saturated by these guys. Right, and everybody's drawing 25. Mm -hmm. Instead of one guy or two guys running an area and drawing 100 right. plus, so what, what the deal? Right. Do you think that the wrestling product on TV um, has influenced the way that people wrestle Absolutely. from your era? Because, again, like you guys, you had a certain way. Uh, of wrestling, like I talk to even some of my friends who are younger than me, and I'll hear them say like it's old school, like you know Attitude Era, and that blows my mind. Do you think that some of that is the reason why wrestling is different now too? I think the biggest problem is is that Vince is swallowing up all of independent wrestling. He when he started, he put all of the territories out of business, and as time goes on, he's killing wrestling. They're a corporate structure. They're a publicly traded company. They have a responsibility to people who own stocks to make it for them. So they're going to do it by any means necessary. And that means, in my opinion, distorting the wrestling business to what they need. It's not wrestling anymore. It's entertainment. It's completely changed. I don't like the WWE at all. I don't like it at all. Will I watch WrestleMania this Sunday? Yes, I will. Yeah. <laughs> because everybody will. Right, it's mania. But I don't like it on a whole. You know what I mean? Yeah. I get very aggravated when I watch it because it's geared towards the masses now. It's geared, you know, it's not wrestling anymore. Now, do you uh, do you try to watch TNA at all? No. <laughs> yeah, I just gave up on that. I just can't watch it. <laughs> it's, it's so terrible to me. I just can't watch it, you know? And there are guys there that I know. Right. You know? I understand um, Eric just got signed. The heck's his work name? I can't believe it. it's uh -oh. out of my head. <laughs> Eric, Easy e What's his name? Dun, dun, dun. He's part of the new tag team. Have you guys watched it? I don't watch TNA either. <laughs> oh, I can't remember. I can't, I can't believe this. I used him so many times. I can't remember his name. His real name's Eric. It's going to come to you later on when you're like driving home. You're just going to randomly yell it out. He's Ugh. tag teams with the other guy. <laughs> Oh, oh tag, I never Eric thought attacking with the other guy. You know what's funny? I never thought that I would talk like the old timers did twenty right, years right, ago. Yeah. <laughs> and here I am, that other guy. Oh, uh, what's that guy's name? The place was filled to the rafters. I'll tell you. Damn it! Oh, I'll remember it later. But uh, there's um, guys there that I know, and yeah. I, I don't even like the product at all. <laughs> we're gonna get back to the uh, the Salisbury Beach. <laughs> uh, you said that at one point Maldoon just disappeared. Yeah, he was just gone. Now, did you? Was there? A noticeable effect on the product. Yeah, it was uh, feast of famine. I, I was 
All of a sudden, Muldoon was gone. Most of the workers disappeared because he wasn't there. I still wanted to work there because I loved the deal I had. Yeah, yeah. So before you know it, now I'm on top with Big City Mike. I'm working the main event every single weekend with Big, Big City, City Mike. Mike. Yeah. Yep. And he says to me, what, what can we do for a blow off? What 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 do you want to do for a big match? I said, let's have a Singapore Canyon match. He goes, what the hell's that? <laughs> I said, we get a Singapore Canyon, we hang it above the ring. I said, you're taller than me, you'll get it first. I said, and we'll beat the shit out of it with it. Okay, he had no idea. Just none. no clue, yeah. <laughs> none, none. I gave him the address. He ordered two Singapore Canes in case we broke one, threw one into the ring, hung it, hung it up. He goes, okay, what do you want to do? I said, let's go out there and wing it. <laughs> Screw it. Screw it. He it's says. Work. All right, I said you're going over. Obviously, it's the blow off. We went out there, and, and if you don't rig them things properly, they can hurt. We didn't real rig real bad. Like you said, you just said you bought two. You threw them under the ring, right. hung one up. Yeah, them things are pretty vicious. Right, uh, and I think he thought I was going to work it when I hit him. Yeah, no. Because as the match went on, the shots got increasingly hotter and yeah. hotter and hotter. <laughs> We were juicing. I had welts all yeah, over my body. Oh, man. It was nuts. It was just nuts. And he had no idea. To the fact that when the match was over, we got in the back, and we're looking at each other. And he's looking at me, and the only thing he could do was shake his head. <laughs> like, awesome idea, dude. Yep. I think this may have been a terrible situation. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The fans loved it. Yeah, fans, fans went wild. Yeah, all 17 of them. Now, attendance had been hurt? Well, attendance was hurt, but actually that night there was about a foot of snow on the ground. Oh, okay. So only the people who could walk to the arena were, we're there. there. Right, yeah. I was like, Rick, why don't we just blow it off and we'll do it next show? No, we're doing it tonight. I was like, okay. Just adamant about doing it. Yeah, so half of being a little pissed off about that and half of if you want to do a Singapore Cana match, we're going to do Screw a Singapore yeah. Cana <laughs> match. Oh, my God. I, I think the first time I hit him, he, he was in complete shock. I don't know. <laughs> so you find yourself, you're on top. Yep. Um, how long are you? do you stay with, uh, how, how long do you stay wrestling at Salisbury Beach? How long are you there for? Until the paydays dropped to, to 25 bucks a match. And that was it. That's when it started. And that was it. Used to, mainly because attendance had been hurt. Yeah, and, big time. Everything was just big going time. down. And I was trying, he was telling me to get workers because nobody wanted to work up there anymore. So I was starting to bring in guys that I had brought along, TJ Richter, uh, Alex Payne, yep. guys like that. I was starting to bring them up there and cultivate them and try to get them to be bigger and actually and, and get work. And Yeah, actually, TJ Richter was only a ref then. But uh, I was going to transition him into a worker. Right. And... Um, he was just, I mean, it would, it would, it was bad. There was no money for paydays. He would say to me, tell your friends I'll get them next time. And I'm like, dude, I promised them, you know, I told them yeah. you're going to give them their 25 bucks. And now you want me to tell them, you know, I'll get them next time. So you're going to get them for 50 next time? No, I can't do that. Uh, you know, yeah. here we go. <laughs> so that's basically. So the paydays drop off. And yeah. where, do, where do you go? 95. Now I'm drawing a blank. That was ninety five, ninety six. I came home <laughs> for the first time in a long time. <laughs> I came home, yeah, and I had to start. I had to get a job, and then I had to start looking for indie work again. Oh, I went to Power League. Right to Power League, yeah. Yeah, I went to Power League just because it it would give me ring time, and I could keep doing it was close something. enough, right? So yeah, was... and plus they gave me carte blanche. They would, if Mark Amaral was booking, he would call me and say, hey. You want to do a program with somebody? Who do you yeah, like who to do you work want to with? Work, kind of, yeah. And and basically, Carlos and Derek were my students. So, um, Shane Simons and yeah, uh, yeah. Derek Mohan. So I would work with them. I'd do programs with them, and they would get better, and I would get ring time. That was basically what it was all about, you know. We got to get uh, Redemption on here for a podcast soon. I want to do one with him. I actually bumped into him a few days ago when he mentioned that. I know I dare you bumped into No, him. not that Derek. Oh, oh. I thought... <laughs> That's Derek Nally. No, oh, oh. This okay. is Derek Mohan, a defenseman. He's uh, Chris Blackhart's right hand man at Showcase. Oh, okay. You I... know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I got you now. So, yeah. Oh, yeah I like that guy. He's a nice guy. Yeah, but it's, I. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, well, I say everyone's a nice guy. Good for I you. Good man. Ground. Good. That's. I didn't realize it was trash talking. That's what I'm not trash talking to anybody. Oh, no, there's no trash talking. No. 
Um, so you said you work with those guys. Was he doing the Jason deal then? No, I think he did that in New Hampshire. I think he did it like sparingly for Power League at that time. He okay. wasn't doing that. He was Derek the defenseman okay. doing, doing stuff there. And I was basically doing independence wherever I could get him. Uh, we were working for Just Incredible was running shows when he was still P.J. Walker. Yeah. He was running shows in Connecticut. We were doing shows for him. We were doing shots for him. Worked with uh, That was my first time I worked with Paul Roma. He was a good guy. I don't know if you guys remember who he oh, is. Oh, yeah, yeah. He got blackballed. He's he's not allowed to get in the ring anymore. They cut him out of the Horseman documentary too. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> they, they they trashed all over him or whatever. Wow. So that's a shame. I never. He was great. Didn't it come off pompous no. or anything like that. With not you? at all. Him and Tony Atlas took turns chopping me in a battle roll in Connecticut. It was awesome. Yeah. And they were <laughs> they were laughing so hard in the back. They were like, "You're the best man. Thank you." I'm like blood blood yeah, dripping yeah. down my <laughs> chest and bruises and stuff. I'm like, You're "Thanks, welcome. guys. Yeah. I had a great time." So. And I basically did indies everywhere. You know, we would put, we'd get guys that I know. It was usually Alex Payne was on the road with me everywhere lot, yeah. I went. Yeah, because I took him under my wing. He was 15 years old. He came to Coastal Pro, and I said, this kid's got something. He okay, is, yeah, yeah. Is, he's got it. He was a big kid. He was hitting the gym. 15 years old, he had muscles. He was stacked. So I was like, okay, I'm taking this kid on the road with me, you know, and we got to be good friends and. And we took them everywhere. We put four guys in a car and drive 10 hours. We don't yeah. care. We don't care, you know? Just but get then, to the show. Yeah, but then you've got the same problem everywhere. You get there, and the money you talked about on the phone is never the money you get when you get yeah, there. Yeah, money's you know? not right. Yeah. So there were, there were people got roughed up. Things happened. You know, belts disappeared. Whatever. You don't promise a guy a, a $100 payday. And have them drive 10 hours with three other guys in the car. When they get there, say, oh, I'm not going to draw. I can't pay anybody. You can't do stuff like that. Right. So. I, I always felt uh, a promoter shouldn't rely on the door for the money to pay the boys. Good or, point. Or to pay the bill. You know, f you should have your expenses covered no matter what. In you draw LPW, nobody. if I didn't draw, it wasn't the boy's fault. It was mine. Right. I'm the promoter. I'm the one responsible for putting the people in the seats. You're the one responsible for keeping the people in the seats. Right. I got to get them there first. You bring them back. That's how it works. My paydays were always covered. Always covered. So you're working everywhere. Yeah. Uh, earlier you mentioned, uh, you know, you start doing the hardcore style stuff. Yeah. And you said this is 96. Yeah, 97. I did a lot of Singapore Canaan matches. Said, that's when that hardcore stuff really started popping off, especially right. in the New England area. Right. We did, um, you know, garbage can full of weapons. We did tables. We did everything. You, you name it, we did it. Yeah, and you were just going everywhere and just. Absolutely. Now, who were you working with a lot of the same guys or like you said? Yeah, a lot of times I would try to book the match. Okay, so you you try so getting matches. If you, if you try to, yeah, if you yeah. talk to a guy in New Jersey and you're like, "Hey, I'm interested in coming down," you know, this and that, and then you send a promo package, you send your pictures, you send a DVD of, of in those days it was a VHS. VHS. Yeah, <laughs> you send a VHS tape of a match or whatever. He agrees to book you. I tried to book matches. So if there were four guys in a car, you got two matches going down for the promoter. Right. You know, or a tag match. Whatever. Right. Whatever they need to do, right. you just go down there with. Yeah, right. I got you. Right. So we, we worked everywhere. We worked everywhere, even Canada. Now you got took a, you said a, a Canadian trip out there. That yeah. was, I'm assuming pre, uh, um, I can't, passport days, right? So it's just oh ID. yeah, you could drive. You'd stop at the border. They'd say, "What are you here for?" And we'd say, "We're professional wrestlers. We're going in to wrestle." They'd say, "Pop the trunk." Yeah. They'd go and they'd look in the trunk and everything, and they'd say, "How long are you gonna be here?" If it were a Friday, Saturday, two days, yeah, a couple days, days, whatever. Yeah. Okay, boys. Have a safe trip, whatever. They're just looking for drugs or you know, right, whatever yeah, right. it is. But that was it. It was easy in those days. You can't do that now. <laughs> now, what, what was it like working in Canada? Was there a difference fan-wise, wrestling-wise? No, it was kind of the same. I mean, they all speak French. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. They're booing you in a different language or whatever. No, it was boo. Yeah. <laughs> it was boo. But, I mean, it was, it was kind of the same. You show up, you do a shot, you're done, you know? Going out to eat afterwards was a struggle. Right. Can't order any food. Yeah, <laughs> but that's it, you know? It's a hamburger. Give me hamburger. That's it. I always wanted to wrestle in the origin of my last name. There actually is a Lausanne, Canada. Yeah, so you were trying to... <laughs> I always wanted to work there, so I was always trying to get close to it or work there. 
But that's my family founded the province, of, supposedly. Who knows? Everything's a lie <laughs> anyway. It's a work. So, so. <laughs> you're working everywhere. Yeah. What, what, what direction are you moving towards? Are you trying to, to no. get signed? No. Are you just trying to make a – you're not trying to make a living on the Exposure. road anymore? Or just Exposure. get that name out? Get that name out, yep. Hit as many places as you can and get that name out. Get enough promoters to know you so that when, you know, somebody needs somebody or a break, oh, yeah, I heard of that kid and this yeah. and that. Exposure. you got to get out there. you got to get your name out there. you got to get your stuff out there. you got to get in magazines, things like that. Now, during this time, did you ever think maybe you would start running your own promotion? I always wanted to. Oh, so the dream, the, the idea was always there. The idea was always there. Correct. When did it start getting? Um, uh, two thousand eight. We started talking so, about it. So starting to push forward a little bit. So yeah. w- when did you stop wrestling? That's a blur. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I ever stopped. I always you just kind of you just kind of. What would happen at the end when I couldn't move anymore is Power League would call. Carlos would say, hey, you know, you want to do something? And I was like, oh, I can't move anymore. And he's like, well, come up with a gimmick where you need to move less. Very limited <laughs> so movement, yeah. So Do It the Dollmaker was born. And uh, I don't know if you guys ever saw that abortion. Wow. Say it again? Stuart the Dollmaker. And you were a creepy dollmaker? Mm-hmm. I would like to see some of this. <laughs> okay. You got a lot of time on we, your hands. We should have asked you to bring a best of before yeah. coming over. Oh, God. <laughs> that would have been great. Oh, God. So uh, tell me a little bit about Stuart the Dollmaker. Stuart the Dollmaker uh, was a gimmick that I created in my head because I couldn't do much in the ring anymore, so I wanted to become more of a brawler. And I always admired George the Animal Steel, and that's the root I of say. the gimmick. So what happened was I put on overalls like I was working in a workshop, (laughs) and I carried a toolbox full of doll pots, Okay. and I was Stuart the doll maker, and I had an actual doll. I had a valet that would accompany me to the ring. Oh, really? Looked like a doll that some kid played with and (laughs) ripped the pot and stuff. Yeah, she would come. Her name was Brat, and she would come to the ring with me, and Stuart the doll maker's kind of the voice came from... uh, George the Animal Steel, and uh, all I would say was doll. Every yeah. time somebody would say something, I'd say doll, doll. And then I do. I did a thing where I would come out to the announce table and I would say, "Wait, wait, I gotta pee." And I close my eyes, act like I'm peeing in my pants. Okay, all set, and go back in, and the people seem to enjoy like that. It sounds like I would have been a huge fan of Stewart. Really, that's interesting. Well, all you got to do is go to the Power League website. I believe all that stuff is... All that stuff is still there. I can, I can go back. I think so. Check out the library. It's powerleaguewrestling.com, I believe. Yeah. And you said, so there was never really like a retirement match or... Somebody, yeah, yeah, there was a retirement some match Some of these guys on retirement tours. Like, uh, there was Jose. a retirement match in 99 for Power League, but I wasn't happy with it at all. I mean, I, I when I'm not happy with something, I kind of put it out of my head. It's not one of them things that stick in there. My brain doesn't work the way it should anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, we did a, we did a, a hardcore retirement match in 99. I worked with Shane Simons yep. first, but he was under a hood. He was doing the Universal Soldier. And uh, I went over on him, and they awarded me the title. And they weren't supposed to award me the title, but nobody told Tom the angle. So Tom (laughs) awards me the title. I'm like, what are you doing? This is not what we talked about. And then Alex Payne came out, Steve Langa, and I worked with Steve Langa for another 10 minutes and then went over on him and won the title and then retired. Apparently in Power League, the only way for me to get the heavyweight title was to retire. Retire immediately after. Yeah, they didn't want me to hold it, apparently. (laughs) So, which makes no sense because I spent all those years there cultivating those guys, new guys, green guys, all this other stuff, but don't put the strap on the guy who's teaching everybody. Yeah. Okay, you know, it's your promotion. Do what you want to do. Yeah, I had to retire. I had to agree before they put that strap on me. <laughs> I had to agree home. that I was going to relinquish it at the next show. Okay. So the retirement match happens, you said 99. Yeah, it was 99. You don't start running a promotion until 2008? No, I was still working. I retired for Re- okay, a, so a little it was, while. It's like know. a funk retirement kind Absolutely. of thing? Absolutely. I had so many funk retirements, I think I'm more than neck and neck with it. <laughs> yeah. So the book is really, you didn't, since then, you haven't really retired but slowed down. Well, you know booking. what happens is you get really hurt. Right. You get hurt to the point where you're like, I can't do this anymore. The pain is too much. 
And three months later, you feel like yeah, a million like, bucks. Oh, and you're like, oh, hey, pick up the phone. Hey, can you use me? You know, stuff like that. So uh, what uh, what was it that got you to start your own promotion? Like, Because you said the idea was there the whole time. Right. What was it that finally you were just like, screw it. I'm going to I'm going to do this. Well, I was basically my girlfriend pushed me to do it because I was sitting home moping around, not wrestling, watching wrestling, criticizing the TV, just yelling at your television. Absolutely. (laughs) Going crazy. You know, I can't stand what you're doing. She's like, well, if you can do it better, why aren't you doing it? I said, who who said I could do it better? I didn't say I could do it better. I'm just just miserable because I can't get in there and try to do anything. So she kept hounding me. She's like, you know what? We're not doing anything. Let's run a business, start a business. You know what you're doing. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And she just kept hounding me and hounding me and hounding me. I said, okay, look. You realize that this could fail. Now is not a time to do a wrestling promotion. You realize we could go under. I'll do the best I can to make it work. But you realize it's a chance. She said, is it what you want to do? Of course it is. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. We're going to do it. So it takes me three months to find a building. Now, do you think you went naturally back to a mill because of your beginning days of training and wrestling in a mill? Yes. Yes. I I always felt comfortable. I thought that's where wrestling should be run. I think a mill is a perfect venue for wrestling. So let's do it. I wanted to do Fall River. Contrary, now we can get a little controversial. Okay. Contrary to popular belief, I did not do it to put Top Rope out of business. I did it because Fall River was my favorite place to wrestle. And Vince McMahon said himself, if the bottom ever fell out, I'd go back to Fall River, Massachusetts. I didn't know that. that He he said said it himself in an interview. He said Fall River has the best wrestling fans he's ever seen. That damn Omri, man. That, that's a magical building. <laughs> uh, absolutely. That's And that's what he was talking about, the Fall River Omri. Right, yeah. I, I never got to attend any of the WWF shows that were there. I was, yeah. I was pretty young, but a few of our friends did. And, and again, they talk about how awesome that building was. To just fill up. I have slight memory of seeing Tatanka when I was younger. I have oh, an yeah. awful memory, so I believe I went to one of the shows, yeah. So, you guys, so the, the Fall River, I heard that, you know, Lethal Pros come in. They want to they, they want to put top rope out of business and and yeah. all that stuff and yeah. you say none of that's true it's just because paranoia you like, yeah you just uh, you say you like just Fall River right well, there well I went on TV and I went on record saying you know there's two reasons why I want to run in Fall River okay and this is what pissed everybody off I'm not af- I'm not afraid to do what I believe in doing so if if I get on TV and I say what I believe I'm gonna say it. So I said, these are the two reasons why I want to run in Fall River. Spotlight, right? You were on Spotlight? Yeah. Did okay. you see that? I, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, one, Fall River is the my favorite place to wrestle. I absolutely loved working in Fall River. I love the fans, and I want to give back to them. That's number one. But two, I can do whatever the hell I want to do. Right. That's and, what I said. Yeah. And it's true. I don't care if, if there's another promotion there. I'm not doing it to put you out. How the hell can I put you out of business? You don't pay any rent. Even if you draw 50 people, you're going you're gonna to do well. Hello? It's true. They have that PAL. I mean, you can get mad. I'm sorry if you're upset with me saying this, but they have that building, and they ought to thank their lucky stars that they do because that building is awesome. It is awesome. It's a great wrestling venue. Awesome. Unbelievably awesome. And they don't pay much rent, from what I understand. So, more power to you. I'm glad they're still in business. I'm glad they do well. I have no ill will towards them at all. None. I've been harassing Steve Ricard to do a podcast for a while now. You should. I'd like to hear his rebuttal. So, uh, yeah, starting up Lethal Pro Wrestling, who do you call? Yeah, I'm sure you have all kinds of connections from your past friends. Uh, I'm sure you need a little bit of help of getting things together. Who do you make the call to? Well, the first person I told was Alex Payne because he was one of my great friends. So I said, hey, we're going to do it. And he's like, we're going to do what? (laughs) (laughs) I said, I'm going to open my own building. He's like, yeah, right. Thought it was a rib because I rib him. Unbelievable. (laughs) All the time. I mean, you name it. I've ribbed him. So he's like, yeah, okay. Sounds good. I was like, all right, so I'll let you know when I have a building. You can come down and check it out. Okay, sounds good. Call him up a few months later. Remember I told you I was going to 
get a building? Yeah. You want you want to come see it? He's like, yeah. Where is it? So I tell him where it is, right? And at this time, everything was hush hush. I wasn't telling anybody right, right. because I had this whole marketing strategy, right? I love that I can talk. Thank you so much. I'm so happy I can talk about this stuff now. So, so um, your first idea was I need a building. Mm-hmm. That's the first step. Right. I say, let's hear about that marketing strategy. Oh, please continue. <laughs> Uh, my apologies. So he, so he comes to the building and he says to me, what the hell are you going to do with this? This looks like crap. There were metal racks hanging everywhere. Yeah. There was all kinds of crap all over the place. I said, you can't see it. Yeah. yeah. You don't, you don't have my vision. You can't see. I said, trust me, just trust me. So he leaves. I don't know who he told. I don't know what he said, but there was a buzz going around after he left. Right. Okay. So word got out. Right. Word yeah. got out. It took me four months. All the racks were gone. Floor was painted. All the walls were painted black. The I poles, wanted, you painted the poles too, right? Everything. Right. I there. wanted an old TV feel. Right. To the place, right? You know, like 10 rows, black wall in the back. Mm-hmm. You know, tight like that. I, I, I went to uh, one or two of the LPW shows in Fall River after... One, I, I went to a couple of brick house trainings there too. Were you guys working at that point? Uh, we had stopped. Okay. And we were just getting back into it. There is absolutely no reason why I wouldn't have used you guys. Because right. the first time I saw you, I popped. <laughs> Thank you. I did. <laughs> I was like, they should have been on an LPW show. This is crap. I was so upset. Yeah, we, we, had, uh, we had stopped for a while and we were just getting back into it. Uh, and we were going to like brick house trainings at okay. the LPW. Building. So there was a reason that you were yeah, yeah. with me. Okay, because I would have used you. I definitely would have used it's you. It's funny because I remember you had seen us at the train. And we, I think we went to two brick house trainings there, mm-hmm. and we went to a show, and you remembered us. You were like super friendly, thanked us for going to the show. I can't remember. I'm sorry. I apologize now. I can't remember what happened yesterday. Yeah, no, no. It's all, I'm just saying you were, right. you remembered us. You were, you were like super nice to us. I just remember thinking like, oh, that's cool, man. Like, mm-hmm. He's going out of his way to thank us for coming to his show because we, we went and seen Scott Levesque versus uh, Rick Fuller. Right. And just because we're friends with Scott Levesque and <laughs> Levesque got the business that night. Uh, he blew a spot. You can't blow a spot. Now, now with Fuller. No. <laughs> you can't. He doesn't tolerate it for some reason. I don't know why. But, but the, the, I blew two. Yeah. Blew yeah. two spots. <laughs> it's just done after that. Um, just th- that building was awesome. You guys, yeah. you could see the work that you guys put into it. Like you said, you painted the. The walls, the floors. You ha- you guys had like a, a mural kind of deal on the wall with the logo. Yeah, I paid four or five hundred bucks to have somebody come in and paint the wall. You know, the whole yeah. building co- was color coordinated. The seats were black and red. The wall was black and red. Everything, it looked like super nice. And you mentioned the the amount earlier. I don't want to say how much, but you got you put some coin into that building. Absolutely, it was thousands and thousands of dollars, thousands. You know, and then that's another thing that came out of that. People saying, "Oh, he spent all the money on the building, and didn't know how to run a business." Ugh, why that's what you kills say you, right? Like that. <laughs> why? That's not, no. That's not why it was put out of business. You know, here we are, the first time in in history, the real story is going to come out from my mouth, and if people don't believe it. Wipe your ass with what you say about me. <laughs> That's all I got to say. So continue. I was, I'm sorry. I was say, no, 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 dude. <laughs> never apologize. This is the Matt Cast. We just babble here. This is what if that, I feel like. The the conversations come out so like everybody tells the truth down here. It's organic because we're just talking. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. like you you asked beforehand. Like, do we have a a set schedule or whatever for the podcast? And it's kind of like no. Right. We just grab the microphones and let's let's just start talking. Masa Mac never knows what's going on. That's the truth. <laughs> Yeah, that is the truth. Well, you have to confirm it from my mouth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want people to think like you left the room and I was making fun of you and you went around. I, I like at least wanted to trick some people into thinking that maybe he knows what's going on. But no, that's why I got you here, dude. Thanks. All right, so you guys, you do the building up. This big screen TVs. You guys have like an entrance ramp. The way that I, I, the the building was set up, awesome. I built it all. So you were buying the wood, cutting it, building the staging. Absolutely. I did it all. all I that painted stuff. the walls. I bought the staging. I bought the rings. I put the stuff in the building. I did everything. Now, everything. What was the uh, where? Where did the choice come from to do a six sided ring first? I just kind of wanted. to. I didn't do the six sided ring first. I did a square uh, ring it first. Was the square ring first, and then the I six-sided? bought this. I bought the six sided ring because I wanted to have both. 
so right. I could switch off between the two, do gimmick matches. It was a gimmick. It was a gimmick. Right, and, and you could say, like, the only six-sided foot in New and, uh, six-sided ring in New England. And I did. Yeah. And uh, it was a gimmick at first, and then the boys complained incessantly. <laughs> we hate that ring. We don't want to work in that. To his credit, Brickhouse Baker never said a word. Nope. He said, I don't yeah, he, he ran trainings in that ring all He said, the time. I don't he care. Ring's a ring. Yeah. He said, we'll, we'll, we'll adapt. But everybody else complained, complained, <laughs> complained. I hate that ring. When are you putting the square ring back? Oh, my God, that's terrible. The ropes are too tight. They hurt. I'm like, what are you guys, pro wrestlers or Betty Crockett's? <laughs> so the hexagon ring lasted four shows. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. it. And um, so you guys are you run shows, and they're drawing well. You guys are doing real well down there. Okay, here's the marketing strategy from oh, that's the right, beginning. that's right. Um. Let me tell a story on TV to intrigue people. I want to grab them from the beginning and then tell a story up until we open the building. So the first commercial is a skull, music, information. Just a little tidbit of information. That and on Raw, right? Yeah. Raw, SmackDown, and every other channel Just what, on cable. whatever else. Yeah, yeah. I spent, I'll, I'll tell this, I spent over $1,000 on Just commercials. On Just on TV spots. Just on TV spots. We were on... Raw and SmackDown, I was on Comedy Central, I was on Cartoon Network, I was on Spike TV, I was on TBS, I was on everything that my demographic watches. Right. You know, from like 15 to 30. Right. Every, everything they watch, I was on it. And the first commercial, all it said was, Fall River, here's your wake-up call. Right. I remember these commercials. Right. And then, the set, see... It's if if I would have thought about this, I would have brought you guys the best of LPW one, and as a gift for having me. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> and I will get it to you from. from I will get it. Much to appreciated, you. man. Thank you. Uh, okay, you're welcome. And um. So then the second commercial gave a little more information, and then the third gave a little more, and then the fourth one I put Scott Ashworth in the commercial right. because I figured Fall River. Yeah, everybody, if you draw. know wrestling and you're from forever, you know And Ash. I got huge responses for that, and I was yeah. like, good, it's working. My advertisement's working. Well, somebody went outside the night of the show. I vomited seven or eight times. I was a nervous wreck. I, yeah, yeah. I was. Show one. This right? was yeah. make, make you or break you. You know, all the crap that I had been talking all these years would be shown now, you know, if I've been saying I can do this, I know how to do this, I know how to do that, this would prove it, you know, and somebody looked out the door, and then Alex Payne runs in the back, grabbed me, kissed me on the lips, <laughs> I'll never forget it in my life, and he said, you did it, I said, what do you mean, he said, the parking lots fill the lines down the street, yeah, really, he's like, yep, he said, that's it, he said, this place is gonna be jamming, and... My nerves kind of calmed at that right, point. Yeah. I was all right after that. But the whole day leading up to it, and we weren't going to open. We had the fire department come in on Monday. Our first show was on Saturday. Right. And the fire department said, you can't open this place. You need emergency lighting all down this back hall. You need more strobe lights for fire. You need more signage. You need this. You need that. We're not giving you a permit. You can't open on Saturday night. So a mad rush at that point for you. Monday was hell. Tuesday was hell. Thursday was hell. Friday was hell. Right up until the last second on Friday. They supposedly could issue the permit until 4 o'clock on Friday. Yeah. I think the fireman showed up at 5 minutes of 4. Just, yeah. We got <laughs> so all that work right done. There. We got all the work done in one week. He showed up. He said to me, I'm issuing the permit, and I just fell on the floor. I said, thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. We had problems with the health department. See, my problem with business is I'm legit. Right. No you one else out there wants to do everything that you need to do for business. Yeah, it costs a lot of money. Yeah, it's really hard to do. Yeah. But I didn't want to go down for something that I didn't do. Right. We had a building inspector. We had to get a permit for that. We had a health inspector. We had to get a permit for that. I had to get a permit to sell food. Couldn't sell food unless it was wholesale. They wouldn't let me cook food on the premises <laughs> without a kitchen. I had so many problems. We had a kitchen built right before we got broken into. We were going to start serving food on the next show. And 
then it, that's what it happened. So how many shows did you guys, how many shows did you run there? Uh, 15, 16? I was going to say, I know it was more than tw- 12, I was thinking, but 16. 16, yeah. And once a month. For like almost a year and a half, right? right. Mm-hmm. And then you guys just kind of stopped. Right. And the reason behind that, I don't know if, again, fans, I, I know there's a lot of guys who wrestle that listen to the podcast and they know, but I'm not sure if the fans know, people who go to your shows or, but the building was broken into. Well, someone had been coming into the building every Sunday and Wednesday night for months. Uh, when I would come in on a Monday and notice a soda can. Right. Random out and say, something's not right here. Right. Okay. And, and and you kind of just... I had a feeling. Think about and pass it. Well, you know, that that's just a soda can. Maybe I left it there. Maybe, Maybe somebody, somebody left else it. left right, it there. Because right. I had other people who were working for me that came in the building. And, right. But I put it in the back of my head because it, it didn't feel right. Right. There was a dry erase board in the locker room for us to write things on during the shows and stuff like that. And I would write myself a note and come back the next time and it was erased. Or something else was written on it that wouldn't be from one of the boys. Okay. So something weird, like... Right. You're starting to pick up on all these strange little things. Right. Okay. Things started to happen. And then I came in one day and the lights were on. Now, I I had... Anybody who worked for me knew there were a set of things to do before you closed the building down at night. Turn the lights off. Turn the lights off. Check the temperatures. You know, there was stuff to do. You got to make sure things are at a certain level because you guys are trying to maintain your business. Absolutely. It was a legit business. Everything was done by the book. Okay. And leaving the lights on for a whole weekend, not good for business. Right. But, okay. So, I had a kid call me, and he wanted to start training. So, I said to him, I said, well, I got a bunch of guys coming down on Sunday. This was on a Saturday after a show or something. He was like, oh, I'd like to see what the training's all about. Okay. So a bunch of guys were working out on Sunday, and Alex Payne was going to be there, and, and Alex Payne I trust to train people. So I said, well, I'm going to put you in the ring with Alex Payne. You tell me if you like it or not, blah, blah, blah. So I showed up on Sunday, and the doors to get in the building were, the deadbolt was still locked, but the other door, there was a double doors, and the other door was locked, and the deadbolt door was sitting on top of the door. You know what I mean? Like, right, yeah. It was The lock was out, but it wasn't locked into the door piece. Right. So I said, that looks funny. Something's wrong. I walk in, and all my boys are in the ring. And I said, why is the door like that? It was like that when we got here. We thought you were here. So they, they came in thinking, you know, you, you unlocked it for them. You went off to go run an errand or whatever the deal. Right. But you know what? <laughs> I'm walking in, and I'm starting to look around. Everything's missing. The TV's gone. There's a big red flag. You know, the TV's gone. And there's lights around the stage, and they're gone. And there's chairs are all messed up, and you can blatantly see. When when somebody robs the place, they ransack it. You can blatantly see. I'm like, why didn't you guys call me? You know, what the hell's going on? So I went in the back, and I started to look. The belts are gone. Okay. That was one of the first things. That you noticed, yeah. Those belts were, exp- the LPW belt was expensive as hell. But you it's still a, have it. Yes, I do. And, and it's, it's not, it's not you're going to pry right? it from my cold, dead <laughs> hands. It's, that belt is not leaving my possession ever. It's retired. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of come into play in this situation. And, I, again, we had only met a few times at that point, And we didn't really know each other. But the... The guy who stole the belt, and we're going to get more into the, the story of the, the the building. The guy who stole the belt walked stole around. Stole everything. Stole everything. Right. Not just the belt, obviously. but Him and two others. Oh, see, I, I thought it was only one dude. I, I didn't know there was more. Two uh, others. I didn't know there was more, but I figured there had to be more to the story. There had to be other people because the kid seemed a little slow and he was... The, the kid seemed, uh, well, if you're going to rob someone like that, I, I think uh, I can call him uh, that. But uh, anyways, uh, he he seemed small and scrawny, too, not like he could just ransack a, a whole building full of stuff. Somebody drove the truck. That's all I have to say. Yeah. And um, he was walking around the mall, 
and bumped into somebody that we know, Brian Sire, and sold him the LPW Heavyweight Championship. Mm-hmm. And then Sire, I don't know if he spent the rest of the day with the belt at the mall, or but he ended up at our house and said, hey, look what somebody sold me in the mall. And I was like, hey, I need to call Davy Cash to see why the LPW belt is getting sold in the mall. And I guess he went off and, and, and took everybody took care of it on their own. Yeah. But I'm just glad to hear that you have the LPW belt back yes, and I that do. I could try to at least uh, put a little bit of a helping hand. And Because if Sire had not shown up to my house, who knows where that belt would be. Right. Well, Brooke had a lot to do with with getting the the, the belt back, the belt right. back, and and a lot to do with doing the right thing when when everything went down. I appreciate it. I just wish everybody wouldn't have left me out of the loop. Yeah, granted, I'd be in jail now. But, right, yeah, for strangling but, the kid. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they they left me out of the loop, and I didn't know anything for a long time. Uh, you know, the police were no help. They right, were no yeah. help at all. They weren't telling me anything. You know, but. What happened was, as luck would have it, he broke in on a Sunday, he stole a bunch of stuff, and blah, 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 blah. Nobody know who did it. Okay. It, now, now, that wasn't the end, right? There was, there's more oh, after this. Okay. There's more. So apparently Wednesday, he broke it again. Well, lucky for me, a couple of businesses, two or three down from mine. Right, yeah. They actually had two guys working overnight. Okay. Who were in the building. And this kid put on my clothes. And called himself Lethal Paul and was walking around the building with a bat saying he was Lethal Paul. And uh, Creepy. Yeah, a, a little. And uh, the two guys saw him and said, what are you doing in here? And he said, Paul knows I'm here. It's okay. So they went back into their business and they called the police. Okay, like right there. Yeah. Right there. And the police showed up. They caught him in there. They put the cuffs on him. They called me. I came down. Now, I'm sitting as close as you are to me. To the to kid. To this kid. Yeah. And the cop comes over and whispers in my ear and says, don't touch him. Right. Yeah. If you touch him, you're going to jail, too. So. <laughs> you're like, I'm sure, right at that. I'm speechless. Like, yeah, you I'm don't know. I'm speechless. I don't know what to do with myself. I don't. I'm like, then why do you have him sitting here? Get him out of here. Yeah, like, get him out of my face, I don't want him here. Get him out of here, you know? And they're like, well, why don't you try talking to him and get some information out of him? I said, why don't you try talking (laughs) to him and get some information out of him? I don't get paid to be a cop. You know, I'm furious right now. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. They woke me up. I drove from New Bedford to Fall River, come into my building to find out who's ruined my life. Yeah. Very dangerous. Yeah. Very dangerous. Okay. So anyway... That goes down. They find out he's got a bunch of stuff at his house. They return a lot of stuff to me, but nothing worth money. A lot of right, my merchandise, yeah. gone. T-shirts, toys, bandanas. I mean, stuff like that, gone. So you never recovered any of your TVs or anything like that? Yeah, I recovered my widescreen TV. Oh, that's good. They got that out of his bedroom. Out of his bedroom. Yeah. And so, not to cut you off or anything, no, but when this first happened and you noticed your, your stuff was missing... Um, did you have any suspicions on who it might have been? Or Not until they names? caught him. No. Not until they caught him? No. Do you think that this uh, perpetrator was uh, showed up to a few of your wrestling shows and uh, checked out the place first? Well, I didn't know until... I was going to say, this, this goes back to the beginning of the, the training kid, right? Was this the kid that hit you up about training? No, 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 no. Oh, okay, that kid. Okay. This was a totally random kid. But he showed up at a practice, and I got a phone call saying this kid said he's all signed up and ready to start tonight, that he already paid you. So we have a sociopath then is what you're telling me. You just make it up stories to everybody. Right, right. And then, I mean, I, was, I said, no, he didn't pay me. He doesn't belong there. You need to throw him out. And they threw yeah. him out. And I think that's what tipped him over the edge to do what he needed to do. Because he wanted to be part of wrestling so bad, he just didn't know how to go about it. Right. And didn't have somebody to, apparently with a level head, to explaining to him what the scenario was. Right. So he went about it the wrong way, you know. So you, you find out who the kid is. Yeah. You deal with the police. You know, after it's all said and done, you go back into that building and there's thousands of dollars of damage mm-hmm. and missing merchandise. Right. 
that has to be the 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 fatal blow for LPW, right? Well, the worst thing that that really got to me was that the police told me that he told the police he was going to do a match with me and kill me. And there was a 12-inch butcher knife hidden under the canvas. He cut a little hole in the canvas and slid the knife in there. And he said he was going to get in the ring when I was in the ring and he was going to kill me. He told the cops that. Whoa. I see. I... Now, there's a case of being a good heel. Thank you. I guess I was yeah, over. Because yeah. <laughs> some kid wanted to kill me. That's that real heel heat, man. Jesus. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's the scary stuff, you know? No, he was rocking your suit, calling himself Lethal Paul. He wanted to have a match. Do you think basically he just wanted to be you? Is that what the deal was? He wanted to be involved, involved, in involved in wrestling, wrestling really yeah. bad, and I don't think he had the mental capacity to know what to do. Yeah. You know? So, it's 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 a shame but it's it's a good thing the cops were there that night. That's all I can say because I'd be in jail. Right. I feel bad. I feel bad on one half of the kid and the other half. You know, you ruined everything I worked for my entire life, kid. You know. Right. So you can't have. You don't have too much sympathy for him. But you no. Know. I'm on the fence about it. Do you, yeah. <laughs> well, what kind of damage was done to your ring? Uh, I hear different stories about. Uh... First of all, it was all set up for a hardcore match. There was a ladder in the ring. There, really? were, there were chairs in the ring. There were garbage cans in the ring. It was all set up for a hardcore match. He you, cut all the turnbuckles. He was just waiting for you to show up, huh? Yeah. He cut all Jeez. the turnbuckles. He wrapped the ropes the way he wanted to. He modified. This kid had been in there for hours. He modified things to the way he thought it should be. What the hell? He had gear, like T-shirts that he wrote on that he called himself the Heat. Chris Pyro's name at the time. Right, yeah. He called himself the Heat. And Pyro was wrestling for you at the time, too, right? Right. <laughs> right. It was just kind of... It was... Uh, it was it Surreal, was, right? It was out of a movie. You could yeah. make a horror movie out of it. It was really, like, freaky, you know, but... So that's the end for LPW. Well, I couldn't recover. Right. I couldn't recover, you know? And I'd like. And I'm sure I, it, it, it broke your spirit too a little bit. I mean, broke my spirit? Are you kidding me? I went to a deep depression, and nobody knows that until right now, you know. And to all those who said it was an insurance job because my attendance was down, kiss my ass. See, I, I hadn't even heard that rumor that yeah. was like an inside deal. You yeah. were behind it and all that. Oh yeah, that I was the one who orchestrated the whole thing. What are you nuts? See, I wanted to run. Why would I be? I wanted to keep doing shows. Why would I put myself out of business? And uh, so the, at the end of that, is that it for you with wrestling? Did you Have you tried to promote any other shows since then? Yeah, or? I did a UPW show in a high school. I actually did another marketing campaign <laughs> to every high school in the uh, Massachusetts. I sent a package to every high school in Massachusetts on only one bit. Uh, what school? Hanover. Hanover Vogue Tech. And uh, what was the... The, you said UPW, right? Was that Universal yeah. Pro Wrestling? Uh, United? What the hell was UPW? <laughs> Come on, you know. Matt. We know that, yeah, he has no clue. That's a good well, no idea. I'm just making up different things. What the hell was the U? Wrestling. What was the U? I forget. I'm going United or Universal, maybe uh, uh, Unlimited. No. <laughs> it's just yeah, right. Limited pro wrestling. You that just go and just wrestling forever. That's not me. <laughs> I was limited. So was the uh, the idea the same for the uh the marketing campaign the second time around or? No, it was just hit every school and see if they wanted to do a fundraiser. You know, if I yeah. got my information out to every single school, I was hoping to get, you know, uh, at least a few bites, right? There were 400 and something schools I sent packages to, you know, what I mean, I got one back. Yeah. I so got one back. Whew. You know, and it was way too much to go to every school and, and do my pitch. So I figured I'll send a package. Right. You want to do a benefit? You know, no out-of-pocket cost to you. How can you go wrong? Schools it was a good apparently deal. Uh, these days, I don't know what happened. I mean, when I was younger, you know, wrestling would be in high schools all the time. Mm -hmm. And now, kind of rare. You know, anti bullying really, campaign. Yeah, yeah. So no wrestling. Yep. Kind of lame. That's all I'm saying. Oh. I'd like to. I'd like to see more shows in schools. That's what happened with UPW. I asked, I told them they wanted to do a fundraiser. We went there. We talked to their athletic director. We set up a show. We're going to do this, that, and the other thing. I said, I'd like to come here a week before the show and uh, address the student body and kind of hype it, kind of heal to them a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, was that a mistake. 
Oh, man. Show up to the school. They put me in the cafeteria and put a mic in my hand. So that <laughs> so a little girl, little fat girl walked by me. And I said, you need to sit down and shut up and pay attention because you that meal and it won't bother you. Ay, 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 ay. I'm surprised the show went off. Yeah. Because <laughs> they were pissed. All of a sudden, the superintendent teaches everybody's got me in a the room. They're upset. You can't say that stuff to our students. We have an anti bullying campaign. I said, it's not real. It's yeah, yeah. Sell <laughs> tickets. I'm just doing it so that when your teacher, your athletic director gets in the ring against me and my guys, all of the students will want to see him beat us up and go over. And we actually, we put the teacher over. We actually, we gave him the title, but then did the thing where we take it back from him because (laughs) he's not a licensed UPW wrestler. So one of those things. How many of those did you, you said just the one? Just one. Just the one shot for you. That show killed it for me. I went through so much So much bull. They made us pay for numerous cops, you know. Uh, all these extra costs, right? The, yeah. Uh, they they tried to get me to cancel the show, and it didn't happen. You right. Know? They they ran away with the money. We were supposed to have, I had one of my representatives at the door. They had one of theirs. Those two people were supposed to go in a room, count out the expenses, and then split, split the money. Up. Right. Okay. Well, that didn't happen. It was my poor sister who was sitting there with that guy. That guy took the money, ran into a room, and shut a locked door. I flipped. Yeah. I said, this is a bad experience. This isn't going to happen. I ended up making more money than they did, but it was nothing to speak of. I'm right, surprised. Yeah, you nothing. Know, I made. I broke even is what I did. I After paid, cost and all yeah. that. And my payroll was good because I told the boys that were on the show, I'm going to pay decent because this is a high school show. I should do okay. Yeah. You know, and I always believe in paying the boys. Of course, yeah. You're nothing without the boys. So... It was a decent payday, and I paid the boys, and I pretty much broke even. After advertisement and everything I went through, I broke even. So, But I, I said after that, I'm done. Tough experience. No more dealing with schools yeah, or anything like I'm that. I'm done. So where does, that leave, where does that leave you now, Paul? No more wrestling? Well, I got a lot of health problems, and 90% of them are due From to wrestling. wrestling. So I'm just taking care of my health. I'm just trying to – quality of life is more important right now, so I'm trying to live out the rest of my days pain-free and – I'm losing the battle on most days. <laughs> Fingers crossed, right? Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. Here's my advice to, to good young guys coming in the business and this and that. The guys who made the most money in the business, Stone Cold, Hulk Hogan, John Cena, those guys don't kill themselves, and neither should you. It's all about getting over with the fans. And however you need to get over, you don't need to kill yourself to do it. I mean, and that's pretty much the most sound advice you're going to get because the guys like uh, Mick Foley who can, can't can walk mm-hmm. and have, like, you know, uh, memory loss and all that because of wrestling every day and wrestling as hard as he did and doing as much as he did right? compared to, like you said, uh, I mean, uh, Stone Cold obviously not in the, uh, the, the – his knees are blown or whatever the deal, but – right. Much better shape than full is. Right. And uh, I don't know, man. I always... People are into that whole super kick everybody, you know, a thousand moves, top rope pile driver stuff. And I still think that there is a market for, like, reg, like old school wrestling still. And, I, you know, little kids... Less is more. What you guys do is great. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable because the gimmick works it absolutely works the first time i saw you guys you hit the curtain the music hit and you came out and immediately i said money thank you right away i said money i said i don't care if these two guys can't work this is money and you got the ring you could work i was like holy shit (laughs) you know the package is there just keep getting better keep working with guys that are better than you that's how you get better because you take a little bit from each guy and before you know it, the money starts rolling in. And that's what it's about. It's a business. Don't ever forget that. It's a business. We we appreciate the compliment, man. Thank you very much. You're I, very welcome. I mean, and it, it's funny because you, you mentioned the song. And the, our song is a big part of, of our stuff. And I think it should be like that with most guys. It, it, if music doesn't fit you right, it, everything kind of just looks awkward. Right. And it, it should give you the feel, the character that you are. And our song is very, like, upbeat and 
and poppy and dancey and that's kind of what we come out and we're live and we want to high five everybody and make jokes and do all that stuff when you meet somebody for the first time what do they say first impression is the most important thing right so when someone comes through a current that first time first impression if you don't grab those people in three seconds you're dead yeah you're dead and you guys as soon as that music hits most people know who you are and even if they haven't seen you before, you win them over in that first three seconds. You already got half the battle. Yeah. It's already half the battle. Now, when you get in the ring, you don't turn it off. You're a gimmick. You're a character. It's, it's awesome. It is so unbelievable. I think the first time that I saw you guys work, I came in. Did I come in the locker room and tell you? You did. Money. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you guys, merchandising, merchandising, yeah. merchandising. You can make so much money off it's of this. It's funny, too, because that was... One of the shows that we were literally in between T-shirts. We didn't have any shirt. We didn't have anything for sale. And you were like, why don't you have anything? <laughs> we're like, no, we, we usually do. We do. <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah, it was a Woonsocket we'll show, right? What, showcase? Yeah. We didn't talk about that. Yeah, I mean, we didn't really talk too much about the whole SPW thing. Because there was a point where you uh, you like working with Chris, right? Yeah. You showed I up for a while. That, I started the business with Chris. Right. Chris and I sat down in his office, and Chris said, I want to run a wrestling promotion. What do I do? What should I do first? So I built. Him and I sat there. And I'm not saying I did it all by myself. He was right. very instrumental. But we built the ingredients for this. This was before LPW. We put it all together. you know. And uh, Chris has a little bit different idea of business than I do. So I don't think we saw eye to eye in a lot of things. And my health problems came into play a lot, a lot. Right, yeah. And I, I hope he has no ill will towards me. I really don't. But when I can't be there, I can't be there. And, and that's just the way it is. My health is bad. It's really bad. There are things going on that I won't talk about that are really, really bad. Yeah. So, But we started the business together, and I tried to go back. After a while and help him out again. Yeah, you popped up for a little while. For a while, I remember that. Yeah, and the the product that I saw the second time, I was completely not in love with. I couldn't stand it. And so fight my health and go deal with something that I didn't like, I, I couldn't do it. Right. And uh, uh, <clears throat> John uh, Muldoon has actually been, uh, you can see this, he's got more of a hand. Yeah. So I, things, uh, things are getting better, and good. I, I hear, and, and they're drawing more, and they, you know, they put pick their production up a little bit good all that and i think that's a lot to do again with muldoon having more of a hand in things and i think that's awesome because muldoon's the man muldoon was my first pick for a booker in lpw and uh somebody talked me out of it and i'm very sad yeah disappointed very very uh, i'm mad at myself i'm straight up mad at myself for not going with my instinct and listening to somebody else about that not going with your gut so uh, we, we usually ask at the end, like, if you had any advice for the young guys, but you kind of already covered that. And uh, do you see yourself, I, I don't think, getting back in the ring, right? That's that's maybe one more shot. The money's right. Yeah, right, if the situation and the, the money is proper. But do you, do you still see yourself uh, running uh, any shows or, or running a promotion in the future, or is that just all in the past now? It's kind of up in the air right now, but of course I'd love to run shows again. That would be right. the only thing I would do is run shows, you know, but it's kind of all up in the air right now, but someday I'd like to do it again. But is there is there anything else you want to get out there, Paul, before we uh, we wrap it up? Anything you want to say to anybody or? Uh, no, pretty much my advice about the young guys coming in, just respect the old guys, you know. Conduct yourself as a gentleman. Wrestlers have a hard enough time trying to be legitimate citizens in the world. You know what I mean? <laughs> With everybody looking down and making fun of us outside of the wrestling world, conduct yourself as a gentleman. Show up to a show dressed up. Greet everyone. Say hello to everybody. You know, be a gentleman. Just do what you've got to do to change the perception of the business and just respect the old guys, you know, because you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. That's about it. Paul, it's been a pleasure, man. I, it's, we're at two hours Holy cow, really? Flies by fast, right? There's a clock right in front of me. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. <laughs> Time flies on the Matt cast, man. Uh, Who is going to sit and listen to Lethal Paul for two hours? I feel bad for you You'll be guys. shocked, man. <laughs> Dan Strikes, the podcast, has like a thousand downloads. And who the hell is Dan Strikes? You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm sorry, Dan. You know I love you. <laughs> but goddamn, who, who, who downloaded that podcast? <laughs> Oh, that's great. It was Scott Levesque over and over again just listening to Dan Strike. 
But yeah, much appreciation, much love going on um, here at the Madcast. Uh, I would like to thank you once again for coming down, sharing your stories, uh, letting uh, some of the fans know what's going on, what's up, and. Uh, you speak in such general terms. You speak in such general terms, dude. It's so strange. <laughs> you let the people know what the deal is. You know, back then, now, screw it. Who knows? Exactly. I think uh, you guys should do a podcast of you two going back and forth. That's half the appeal. It's awesome. It's half the appeal. I love it. So, uh, much thank yous uh, coming out. <laughs> I'm Monster Mac. I'd like to thank you fans for listening. Uh, training number one. I'm sure he wants to close it himself. So, here he is. Well, Mac, it's not just that I want to close it myself. We have to bring up newrepublicprinting.com uh, and on Facebook and Twitter. Great deals. That's how our shirts. You, you go to you go to shows sometimes, Mac. People are selling their shirts for twenty five dollars. Our shirts usually ten. We try. We like to keep our stuff reasonably priced for our fans. And the reason that we can sell them so cheap is because of New Republic Printing. The, you know, there's no screen charges. Like, Mac, remember the first time you ever did a shirt. I was, I was, <laughs> yeah, I was ironing it on the t-shirt. No, no, no legitimate shirt, not the iron-ons. Well, you know, are you not talking about me and, and uh, the web dude ironing t-shirts on? No, no, no. The first time you went, uh, I can't remember the name of the place, but it was a place oh, no, was downtown in Fall River. Yeah, it was Dockside Inc. or something like that. It's not with Dock in it. But yeah, they, it, it cost me up the ass pretty much is what you're getting at. Yeah. And uh, I found the receipt recently uh, when I was going through my Mac files for that purchase and you guys paid out the ass for screen <laughs> screens and all this bonus ink charges none of that nonsense with new republic printing mac it's all high quality stuff no bonus charge uh, no extra charges no hidden fees even the shipping is included when they give you the quote so check it out newrepublicprinting.com always a pleasure i'm training number one that's Monster Mac. Lisa Paul, once again, thanks for coming out, man. Thank you both very much. I appreciate it. And it was Ultimate Pro Wrestling, by the way. Ultimate Pro Wrestling. Boom. We, we got it before the end of the podcast, folks. I love it. Everybody, have a good night. We'll see you next time.